more transparent economy with Bitcoin and digital assets and join the FinTech Dave House of Uncore. Tonight, he'll be speaking about the health of the global economy and what we can expect in the coming years. Over to Graham. Yeah, let's see. Good evening, everybody. Uh, great to see yeah, Full House and Durban of crypto enthusiasts. Uh, yeah, glad, glad to be spending the evening with you guys. Um, so I'd like to start my talk with a little bit of a thought experiment. So I'd like to start off by asking you all to imagine that you are a person whose sole objective is power. Am I coming through right on the mic? Yes. Sure. Cool. Thank you. Um, and <clears throat> The means of controlling or accessing this power uh, means that you are looking to control as many things or as many people as possible through whatever means possible. You guys got that picture? Cool. All right, so now I want you to imagine that a magical genie comes along. And this genie offers you one wish. And it says to you, I will give you whatever ability that you want in order to achieve your ambitions of power. All right? It's a little bit of a stingy genie. Usually they give you three wishes. It's one, it's one. So you have to work with it. Um, so my question to you is, what ability would you choose? And let's run through a few options. So first of all, maybe we could consider political or military power. Maybe similar to someone like Donald Trump, or potentially Vladimir Putin, or Xi Jinping of China, um, or maybe a global dictator. So that would be political power in its purest form. Maybe it's corporate power. So corporates already have power that expands across uh, national borders. Um, perhaps someone like Jeff Bezos of uh, Amazon, or Larry Page, or Mark, uh, or Mark Zuckerberg, or Elon Musk, the futurist. Okay. Um, what about media power? So media has the potential to shape people's perceptions, their realities, even their perception of truth. What about ownership of land, of raw materials, the means of production, of energy? Imagine being able to hold captive the economy as you hold back the oil needed for the economy to drive forward. Um, that sounds like power to me, right? What about religious power? <clears throat> Maybe not as, as um, important as it once was, but to be able to hand down guidelines or, or rules to the population on religious background, on, on religious purposes, um, also something to consider. So, given all these options, I would still argue that one source of power trumps them all. And in my opinion, this is the ability to create money. Simply put, if you can create money, you could, in theory, buy off the politicians, create your military uh, empire, finance wars, I believe both sides of the war, um, finance commercial, industrial projects, influence lawmakers. Um, you know, they could then put forward laws that suit your agenda. You could influence the media houses to make sure that they run stories that suit your interests. But who has this power? Is there anyone? On earth who has this power to create money? Of course there is. And that's the banking system and the central banks. <clears throat> so obviously when we talk about creating this money, I mean that's this is scared money, right? I know that we're speaking to a crypto audience here, but that would be obviously dollars, pounds, euros. Um, but I think more accurately, if you're talking about this banking system, we should call it potentially what it is, and that's a banking cartel. So a cartel is a collusion between a group of entities to set prices, fix markets, and restrict competition. And this is essentially what the banking and financial system is. So there's one means of, of illustrating this, just a simple example. You know, try to put a business plan together for a bank, apply for a banking regulation license and see how far you get. It's a very restricted industry, okay? and, and, they, and they do well to keep comp uh, competitors out. So, <clears throat> This banking cartel is powerful in many ways, but I would argue that their most powerful um, ability is the ability to create money. But let's go back to the beginning of you know, looking at how we described uh, how you could utilize this, this, this um, ability. And that would be through means of paying off your politicians, paying off journalists, um, bribery, etc. But I think you'll agree that there's limitations to this power because at some point in time, you should ideally be held accountable for your actions. And, and this type of influence is <coughs> really the um, you know, unfettered um, form of, of, of bribery, corruption, and 
you, know, you can only get so far with that. So I think that although these things play an important role in power structures, unfortunately, they do have their limitations, and it sounds like a heck of, of hard work. But I'd like to discuss something that I think is even more powerful, potentially, in this ability to create money, and that's monetary policy. Sounds pretty harmless, right? I mean, if you're watching uh, the news on the TV, or on the radio, and you hear them talk about monetary policy, that's generally a good time to change the channel. Um, you know, I'm, I'm watching the news for, the, for the, the violent crimes, for the sport, and maybe the weather, but don't talk about monetary policy. I mean, that's, that's, that's boring stuff. But if you, if you drill down to what monetary policy is, in my opinion, it's, it's really theft. And it's theft on the greatest uh, scale that we've ever seen in history. So how does this theft work? So, so let's break it down a little bit. Um, so there's two ways that the banking cartel rob you. Number one is when they create finance or, or create money, um, and that's again fiat money, they create it on nothing. They either print it on a piece of paper or they type the numbers into the computer system. Now, that sounds a little bit dubious in itself, but then they actually have the audacity of lending it to someone in the expectation of them paying that money back to them and charging the interest. Sounds like a bit, pretty good business plan, but it also sounds a little bit fraudulent. You know? Kind of makes sense why they want to keep people out of the picture. So, and in that, I think it's important to recognize that for every unit of currency that is created, there's an equal unit of debt that is created, that actually also bears interest on that debt. Where does the interest, or where does the money come to pay for that interest? I'll leave that thought with you. So this is one of the means that essentially the banking system um, attracts funds from the population um, and it's a form of debt. Number two is inflation. So central banks continuously increase the money supply over time by creating more and more money. And why wouldn't you? Because the more money you create, the more debt you acquire and you obviously attract interest payments on, those, on, on that debt. So, but um, at the same time, Economics 101 will tell you that if you increase the supply of a good or a commodity, all things being equal, you expect the value of that good or commodity to decrease. And money is no different. By increasing the money supply, you essentially dilute the value of the money in the system. I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, and this is called inflation. So this is, and, and inflation is a, is, a, is a silent destroyer of wealth. Right? And this is the second means by which um, you know, the, the model of the system extracts funds from the population and essentially enriches the banking sector. So, as I said, this system it creates an environment or an economy where money is silently funneled from the general population to the banking sector. It is the theft of the poor and middle class and enriches bankers in a much more effective way than the almost barbaric forms of bribery and corruption that we spoke about earlier. It's very um, PC. It's a very PC form of theft, right? And in South Africa, we are familiar with the concept of state, cap uh, state capture, but, um, and this is not very dissimilar. The difference is that this is not the capture of the state, but rather the capture of money. So there's so much more to this actual mechanism. I've really tried to um, come you know, strip it down to its bare bones within a limited period of time. Um, it's actually one of the most you know, challenging things in putting this talk together was to try and get that content across. And it takes, it's taken me a long time to kind of get my head around it. So I encourage you to go do your own research on this topic, but I'd be surprised if you didn't come back with the same opinion once you actually drill down um, into the nuts and bolts. So this is not the end of the story, but because besides the, the system essentially being corrupt, and a form of theft of the population, it's also unsustainable. So throughout history, whenever currency has been created in excess, it's led to the destruction of that currency. We can go back as far as the Roman Empire, we can look at uh, post-World War I Germany, Japan in the 1990s, Zimbabwe, uh, more recently, today Venezuela, with Turkey and Argentina following fairly close behind. So they are victims, or at least their, their currency system is victim is a victim of, of excessive um, money creation. And it's all ended in the same way. The only thing different this time is that it's happening on a truly global scale, led by the US, followed by China, Russia, South Africa, India, you name it, all the world powers are printing money on a level that's never been seen before. 
And I think that this can only lead to one scenario. It's happened throughout history. Why should this time be any, any different? Except this time, I think we can just expect um, a crisis of a much larger magnitude. To create, um, to paint the picture in a little bit more detail, since the 2008 financial crisis, um, the excessive creation of money has ramped up exponentially. The purpose of this was to obviously stimulate the economy to get it out of recession, okay, to get the wheels, the cogs of the economy moving again after the crisis that the same banking cartel um, had a big hand in putting us in in the first place. And you see, the solution of the banking cartel to any crisis is to create more currency. When you create more currency, you create more debt. So the wheel turns and the can gets kicked further down the road. I think it's it's, it's arguable what type of actual impact you know, this type of money printing, which they call quantitative easing, which is another word for money creation, um, actually had in stimulating the economy because we still have an economy that's struggling to really uh, prosper across the world. But it was very effective in blowing up big asset price bubbles. So the three biggest asset classes in the world are equities, which is the share of companies, it's bonds, right, which is debt, and you can buy a bond in return for some kind of uh, yield. And thirdly is uh, real estate. So those are your three big asset prices, and all of them have had incredible rises in value since 2008, thanks to this money printing. But my question to you is, where does one put their money? It's, a, it's actually a, a very difficult place to invest, because if you're gonna go into equities, they're sitting at, at um, very, very high valuations. If you're gonna buy a bond, you're gonna get a very modest interest rate, potentially even negative if you're in, if you're in Europe. Um, or you can buy a property. And we don't feel it so much here, but I spent a little bit of time earlier this year in, in Europe and in Canada, and I was just frightened by the, the cost of property. And on average, I found it to be five to 10 times more expensive than South Africa for an equivalent price in an equivalent neighborhood. And this just excludes you know, the middle class from you know, owning appropriate property. Um, so I think that gives you some kind of insight into the level of um, valuation that these assets are sitting at. And obviously that puts you know, the economy in a precarious situation. And these bubbles are almost the sole responsibility of the central banks through the creation of money. These are entities, the central banks, who do not answer to public or political power. They are independent and privately owned institutions. And many economists now agree that the tail effectively wags the dog. Right? It's no longer the economy that's determining the monetary policy. It's monetary policy that is the biggest determinant in, in um, projecting the direction of the economy and obviously the, the, the direction of asset prices. And essentially these central banks are the gatekeepers of money and the most powerful institutions on the earth. Isn't it ironic that this is what capitalism has come to? It has come to submit to a centralized authority that makes decisions based on its own agenda rather than the market forces of the free market. So with all this talk of asset price bubbles, mountains of debt, and currency destruction, I'm sorry if you're feeling a little bit uh, depressed. It's a little bit gloomy in here. But um, thanks for sticking with me, because this, in my opinion, is the perfect um, scenario for disruption. And with disruption, or the potential for disruption, comes the potential for opportunity. Because when we look at the wealth that is tied up in the, in, the, in the asset bubbles and in the existing broken money system, when that starts to unravel, that, those funds have to go somewhere. So they say that you know, wealth is generally not created or destroyed, but rather transferred. So where will it find its new home? So it's my expectation and my hope that it will go to a new sound money. Yes, some of it will go to old money. So gold and silver, over time, have shown themselves to be a good store of value. Um, but if you look at the digital economy that we live in, where we transact cross borders in very quick time, across high-speed internet connections, um, it's difficult to see where gold and silver are actually going to fit into that picture. Besides being an actual store of value, I don't see it being a transactional currency. I don't think many people are going to argue with that. So, What might this new money look like? Well, what about Bitcoin? Or any other form of cryptocurrency for that matter, but Bitcoin is by far obviously the leading uh, candidate to fill this role as a new sound money, potentially. 
So there's three major problems with the current monetary system in my view, and Bitcoin offers a potential solution for all three. And we touched on two of the problems already. Firstly, the creation from debt. Bitcoin is not associated with debt. So through the mining system, through the proof, proof of work, which is an incredible, ingenious system in itself that's been created, there's no debt that's created when a new Bitcoin is mined into existence. So that's great. So now the banking cartel can no longer essentially steal money out of our pockets um, through the interest-bearing debt that's created when that fiat is created. Secondly, it's got a limited money supply. So whereas our fiat today can be printed in infinite amounts um, <clears throat> and essentially robs the population through deflation, Bitcoin, as you guys know, 21 million Bitcoin um, should be inflation-proof. So that means that it should keep its value at least and hopefully increase in value, you know, given that the economy does well. So yeah, that comes to number three, and that's decentralization. So as the saying goes, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So as I've tried to demonstrate, the ability to create money is the ultimate power, and as such needs to be decentralized rather than controlled by a single entity or a cartel. In order for Bitcoin to positively serve humanity, it has to be decentralized. It has to be kept out of the hands of the banking cartel or any entity that wants to control it. That is the form it can take that I think will serve humanity best. And remember that Bitcoin will not be the only competitor in a post fiat world. So let's look at some of the other potential plans in a post fiat environment. So the banking cartel are well aware that the end of currency is at hand and, we, and they are preparing um, for this eventuality. So let me introduce you to what's called a special drawing right, or an SPR. This is the currency of the International Monetary Fund, which itself was established, um, or actually created by the central banks. So the SPR was created way back in 1969. It is used by the Bank of International Settlements, um, which is essentially the central bank of central banks, and this entity uses the SPR as a reserve for the central banks of the world. So I'm going to read you a quote specifically directly from the website, um, just to, um, to understand the direction they're going, because it appears that they want the SPR, the SPR to have greater um, power going forward, greater influence. So based on the quote from the website, it says, special consideration should be given to the SDR for a greater role. The SDR has the features and potential to act as a super sovereign reserve currency, a super sovereign re global. The scope of using the SDR should be broadened so as to enable it to fully satisfy the member countries. Um, therefore, the SDR, which is now only used for governments and international institutions, could become a widely accepted means of payment in international trade and financial transactions. So, active promotion of the SDR will enhance the role of the SDR. So, I think that's quite clear that. They've got a backup plan. If Fiat um, uh, does come under pressure, they are well positioned to bring the SDR forward uh, to, the, to the mass population when the time is appropriate. And this is not conspiratorial in any way. Because it makes sense for the banks to make a backup plan given the fragility of the Fiat that they've created. The other potential competitor could be a corporate bank coin. So Libra, as you guys know, was tabled not so long ago by Facebook. And as days go by, um, it seems less and less likely that that's going to come in, into play. But it's, you know, the cat's out of the bag, and there'll be another coin that'll come along, uh, introduced by a new corporate. And I don't really care what marketing spin they put on it about decentralization. In my opinion, if you're corporate, you're in money, you're in business to make a profit, you can maximize your profit by keeping control of that, um, of that coin or that money. So I, I just don't see them giving it up to decentralization. So these are the players, and the stage is set for the emergence of a new money. This is the battle for the ultimate superpower, the power to create money. Or, on the other hand, the potential to disperse that power through uh, blockchain technology. I expect that Bitcoin will need to stave off many forms of potential attacks, from regulators to supercomputer hacking, government bans, price manipulation, but perhaps the biggest challenge is to gain mass adoption from the public. And look, we shouldn't be under any illusions. Bitcoin is not perfect money. It's got a lot of enhancements. I still get frustrated that I can't buy a cup of coffee with my Bitcoin. Okay, it's still incredibly volatile. But, um, you know, and then also consider that it could be derailed by any number of things. 
um, or even captured by the existing um, banking console. But having said all of that, I still believe that Bitcoin or a decentralized cryptocurrency of some kind is the best shot that we've got as humanity essentially to escape the control of the banking cartel and the banking system. So whilst the new global economy, rather, whilst the new global money appears to be inevitable, a catalyst is needed, the level of faith and comfort in the current system is too great for mass adoption to occur without some form of crisis um, encouraging that. So I've really covered in a little bit of detail the landscape which includes asset price bubbles, uh, currency which is under, under threat, uh, mountains of debt. So I really think that it's only a, a, potentially a small catalyst that can kick off what could be um, the, you know, a massive financial crisis, potentially the biggest financial crisis of our lifetime, but in that lies potential opportunity as well. Yeah, but only once this catalyst really kicks, them off, kick, sorry, kicks things off is when the money battle, the battle for new money really uh, heats up. So one of my favorite quotes comes from Game of Thrones from the character Lord Baelish, also known as Littlefinger. He said, chaos is a ladder. Littlefinger, if you don't know, is the embodiment of self-interest and ambition, and whose ultimate goal is power. Chaos is a ladder. The banking cartel are well aware of this, are you? How this scenario plays out, only time will tell. And rec you know, but recognizing the rules of the game and what is at stake is the first step to aligning yourself on the right side of this potentially epic wealth transfer and the rise of a new money. Thank you. So much. I think you did speak about you know people feeling that was all doomy and gloomy, but it definitely inspired a lot of hope as well. Uh, something that I forgot to mention earlier, and um, since we are at a blockchain event and a lot of blockchain is all about security, I've been asked to please make sure that you keep your either your stickers or your little um, what are these cards on you because we have a very strict security guard outside. We won't get you in unless you, unless you have that on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, will you please stand? I want to play a little game, and there is a prize up for grabs here. So, I want you to sit down if you feel that you couldn't explain Bitcoin to your grandmother. Take a seat. <laughs> to your grandmother is a different thing, hey? I would like you to sit down if you feel that you couldn't explain cryptocurrency exchange to your grandmother. Okay. Please sit if you don't think you could explain the difference between a soft fork and a hard fork. <laughs> And then please sit if you don't think you could explain consensus protocol. What I do is um, I just say the same way we use the internet um, to, to basically transfer information. Uh, now we can't use the internet to transfer money because on the internet you can just copy things, right? If I'm sending Kirsty an image, I can copy the same image and I can send it to my colleague here. So that's why the internet can't be used to send money. We can use it to send information. So blockchain is basically an internet that's created specifically to send money because you can't duplicate things on the blockchain. 
So if I send Iran to Kirsty, the entire network knows that I've sent my one RAND to Kirsty. So I no longer have that one RAND, and Kirsty now does have that one RAND. And everybody on the network can confirm that fact. Are we happy? We think we deserve a surprise, yeah? Williams. Bronwyn is a futurist, an economist, and a trend analyst. Her day job involves helping business leaders to use foresight to design the future they want to live and work in. You may have seen her talking about transhumanism on carte blanche, or heard her talking about trends on 702, where she's a regular expert commentator. When she's not talking to brands and businesses about the future, you'll probably find her curled up somewhere with a preferably paperback book. Tonight, using that experience, Bronwyn is going to take us on a journey into what the future of money could actually look like in decades to come. So, to start with, I think that our first speaker set us up very nicely to give us a context of what's going on in the world of decentralization and money. But I think we can summarize a little bit about what's going on. Should we click through? Where's the pointer? Are you winning today? Winning? Yay! Basically what's happening is where we are going, there are no roads. Just like Back to the Future, which is my favorite movie. It was made the year that I was born, so you can all work out how old I am, you know, when the movie was made. But it really does illustrate exactly what's going on in the world of economics and finance right now. The rules that we based our economic models on are fundamentally changing because of the advent of new technologies and also new mindsets around what finance really is. So I think we've already heard a bit about what's going on with debt. That seems totally sustainable, doesn't it? <laughs> totally, totally sustainable. Nothing, nothing, nothing to see here, right? I mean, who do we owe this money to? That's the earth as, as a whole. And GWP is your, your gross world product. That's the whole earth's GDP put together. We owe a lot of money and we're not even quite sure who we owe it to. Apparently, we follow the money. Quite a lot of it is held in China. A bit of it's in the United States, but mostly carried by future taxpayers. Because as Herbert Hoover said, blessed be the young, because they will you know, pay for the debt we all make one day. That's assuming, of course, that we continue to have more children and that there is growth that continues over a long period of time. So that brings me to probably the first way that the rules are breaking down. And that would be the rise of this heterodox economic policy it is now bringing mainstream approval in very big economies. And it's this idea of MMT, or as I call it, the magic money tree, which is basically the concept that we can just print as much money as we need forevermore because governments have, or at least how this is how the theory goes, a monopoly over money. So this is the logic that is being used to ramp up quantitative easing, even though quantitative easing is apparently no longer a thing. The American government is still printing vast quantities of money and they're not showing any signs of slowing down. This theory states that we can keep on printing money because, you know, we can just keep kicking that debt can further and further down the road. And that's really the question. How far exactly can we kick that can? How many future generations will be prepared to pick up an ever-growing balloon of debt? And the answer to that would be that it could actually carry on for quite a long time as long as we're all prepared to believe in this illusion. The next way the rules are breaking down is the concept of negative interest rates. So negative interest rates also fundamentally change the rules of the way the world of money works. This is actually happening. It's no longer speculation. Economists have long speculated that negative interest rates can't happen because why would you commit to losing a fixed amount of money on your investment? And yet it is happening now in places like Greece and even in Germany. Whereas if you are a saver and you're buying government bonds, you're not committing to get an income from that bond, you're actually committing to get a fixed loss on your investment. So that's a bit crazy, isn't it? Why would anyone commit to a fixed loss? Well, you would do that if you believe that the currency that you invested in could actually lose more money than that bond would, would make. 
But once again, none of our economic models really are designed to make sense of that particular situation. We're in the new world, where are we going? There are no rules, anything goes, anything can happen. So it's all quite fun, because we can all speculate on what's going to happen next. Where are we going? Can we get a nice slide? Fantastic. So just by illustrating what's happening now with the cracks in the system, this I thought was quite fascinating. This is a Lebanese influencer. She's famous on Instagram for promoting clothes and makeup. But more recently, she has been hired by her central bank to promote the lira, her currency. It shows that governments and central banks are concerned enough about people switching over to alternative currencies and things like bitcoins and new cryptocurrencies. That they are actually paying popular culture influencers to promote the use of a fiat currency. So that for me is a great signal that these rules are really breaking down and that no one is really quite sure as to what's going to happen next and just how the new world of money is going to work. For another example of what I'm calling fantasy economics, when the whole value, if you understand what value is, is really breaking down, is what's happening in Venezuela at the moment. Most of you here in this room, but you are here at a crypto event, fully understand about the concept of what mining is. But there's another sort of virtual value mining going on in Venezuela at the moment with all their political and economic crisis. And what we're finding is people are now earning a living by mining virtual gold in virtual reality games. This is because quite a lot of the massive open online games do offer real world value and incentives for trade within those virtual environments. So Venezuelans that can't earn income in their real currency are logging onto games, mining virtual gold, and then selling it to other players who are invested in that game's ecosystem. So apparently the people that are doing this on an ongoing basis are earning something like $40 a month. That doesn't sound like a lot of money, but it is literally money from nothing. It's value that's been created purely by belief in this concept of the game. And it's converting virtual reality into real reality. And it's a great parallel, I think, with what's going on in the crypto industry. But it's essentially the concept is the same. People are now believing in something that might not actually exist. And it gets weirder than that. In Venezuela, you're now getting, say, Asian groups of gamers who think it's unfair that the Venezuelans are gaming the system of the game. And they are actually going into the game and assassinating the players that are engaging in this mining activity. So it shows how many parallels the virtual world is having with the real world. Also, in terms of what's happening with the decoupling, of the tangible world and finite resources with value is what's going on in the new realm of virtual selling of, or selling of virtual assets. So to start with, there's a company in the United States, they're called Genesis City, and they sell plots of virtual land, empty plots of virtual land, for the around about the equivalent of 200,000 grand. So you can buy a patch of imaginary ground, completely blank, nothing on it. And it works as long as someone else is prepared to pay a little bit more, a little bit further down the line. It works as long as the illusion holds. The picture you can see on the screen behind me is from a company called Fabricant. They're a European design house, and that lady is wearing an imaginary dress. So that dress doesn't exist. It exists purely as a photo filter. So much like you put a filter into your Instagram feed, you can buy this dress as a filter. It is tied to a blockchain, which means no one can steal your dress once you've purchased it. It belongs to you and you alone. So it is a tie into crypto and all of that. But what's most interesting about that is the fact that it sold for $9,500. An imaginary dress. That might be a little bit too rich for your pocket, but the good news is you too can own a pair of virtual jeans tonight if you want to. There is a company in the UK that sells virtual jeans that you can wear on your Instagram page or on your Facebook profile for just 20 pounds. That's much more reasonable, right? <laughs> $9,500 for this particular dress. But they're not blockchain logs. So, you know, you might find a few people walking around with the same pair of pants. But if you're okay with that, that's what's happening with the world. And for me, it's quite an interesting concept. When we start thinking about growth, growth in economies traditionally has been tied to scarce resources. It's been tied to our physical environment. That's why you've had future thinkers like Donella Meadows talking about limits to growth and how growth on our planet can't continue because we're going to run out of resources and we're going to run out of sinks. In other words, the place to put our junk and our trash, what's happening currently with messing up our planet. 
But when value and growth is decoupled from the real world, suddenly limitless growth is no longer an impossibility. Growth can continue as long as we are prepared to believe it can, as long as we are prepared to believe in that shared illusion. And that really brings me to the biggest point that I want to make tonight, and that is the fact that all value, all currencies, all of our trade really comes down to Peter Pan's concept of faith, trust, and pixie dust. You can fly as long as you can believe in what is going on. So that means money printing can continue, negative interest rates can continue, all the systems that we currently believe in can continue, and new forms of untethered value and virtual reality value can continue to grow as long as we all collectively believe in the system. But as soon as we stop believing, that's when things can collapse very, very quickly. And that's when you have things like runs on the bank, and that's when you have complete meltdowns in what economies really are. So Terry Pratchett is one of my favorite writers. Yes, I am a bit of a nerd. And as he says over there, money really is just belief. And as long as you can believe it, you can get as rich as you really can. And we know that from the crypto space, how many millionaires and billionaires have been made simply because you were able to get other people to start believing in this new form of value. As long as we believe it, as long as we dream it, we can have it. But when we stop believing, it all falls apart. So that's just a bit of context, but I suppose one of the big issues we're really debating when it comes to the future of money is this dichotomy between are we going to head towards a more centralized world or towards a more decentralized world? And that's the choice that all of us as individual citizens and individual voters have to make. And I always encourage people that if you don't like the trajectory the world is going on, you have to vote with your wallet or vote with your vote for the sort of future that you do want to be a part of. And that means that we have to be proactively conscious about which sort of systems we are supporting with our time and with our money and which ones we are not. So I'm just going to illustrate a little bit about what the sort of centralized world of finance is kind of heading towards at the moment. So we've already heard today quite a thorough description of what's going on with the centralization of power and money from governments and central banks. But I think one of the points that still needs to be made is the fact that digitization does not equal decentralization. Having a digitized currency is not the same thing at all to supporting a private currency such as something like a Bitcoin. Digitized, centralized currencies are quite the opposite. They actually centralize power and control all that more. To illustrate that point, probably one of the best things we can look at is what's going on in China and Hong Kong at the moment. So from my perspective as a watcher and observer of society and economies over time, I really believe that what's going on in Hong Kong at the moment could very much be seen as ground zero or the battle for the future, the sort of ideas we want to take hold in terms of governance and power and society going forward. So this week, we all know the people of Hong Kong did very much take a stand and vote towards democracy or to decentralization of power within their land. Whether that plays out or not is something we're going to have to watch, but I think it's a great case study of what the future can look like when we are battling between ideas of decentralization of power at grand scale and centralization of power at a very grand scale. So just to quickly digress to my favorite topic, I know people have heard me speak or probably tired of me talking about this, but when we talk about centralization of power, we have to look at what's going on in China in terms of their social credit score system. So the social credit score system basically digitizes every aspect of a person's life from their finances, right through to their social behaviors, and then allocates a score. If your scores are too low, you're obviously not a good citizen, so you get less access to opportunity than someone who has a higher score. So I'm not gonna go too much into the sort of social governance aspect of that, Rather, we can then look at what's going on with finances. So when you combine a digital currency with an omnipresent, omnipotent social credit score, suddenly you have a government that is in control of really every aspect of your life. So you can see on the screen behind me there, you've got a bunch of cars, they're all tracked into the social credit score system, all the little bicyclists that you can see in the back there, and all the little pedestrians are all being tracked by facial recognition. But now when you layer on a digitized, centralized currency, it means that if any of these people misbehave in any way, they can have fines deducted from their bank accounts in real time. So that little guy in the back there, he's got a red square on him. He's clearly crossing the road at the wrong time. Before he gets to the other side of the road, 
his cash is removed from his WeChat or his Alipay wallet, his fine is deducted, and he can then carry on with his life. He's been instantaneously punished. So that might be good if you are someone that likes social control and thinks the bad should be punished in real time and all the rest of it, but it does lead to a few interesting scenarios. For example, there was a prominent Chinese businesswoman who was fined for jaywalking and publicly shamed, because that's the other thing they do, they'll broadcast your face on big screens, so you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, did bad things, all the rest of it. Only she wasn't actually walking across the streets, rather because she was a prominent businesswoman, her face was on an advertisement for her company on a bus that was picked up by the system, but she was proven guilty until she could prove herself innocent, because you know, a computer said, you've done this, so therefore you need to be punished for it. So that's the danger of a fully centralized system. We start to lose the humanity and we lose the ability to be free agents going about our lives. So that's a choice that we've all got to make. What sort of society do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a fully centralized society or do we want to live in a society where we retain free will? And it's really a big choice for us as humanity because increasingly we are going to have the option to outsource more and more of our decisions to automated systems and further up the line, not just automated systems, but automated centralized systems that can give us perfectly organized, ordered lives, but at a great cost to our personal freedoms and ability to navigate through the world on our own terms. So another thing to look at then when we start to think about centralized currencies is this concept of bank runs again. So I know we almost back into the 1920s, got this nice little picture up there of the big bank runs that happened at the Great Depression about 100 years ago. But perhaps more concerning to people that are playing in the decentralized currency space is that we are really a threat to the centralized banking system. And we're starting to see, particularly this year, people who work in the exchanges can definitely tell you more about that. I'm sure they'll get to it next today. That banks, central banks, regulators are starting to shut down accounts of people who might have a cryptocurrency account. In some countries, just trading crypto is enough to get you flagged as being a dissident against the system. In other cases, exchanges are no longer to trade, allowed to trade using formal banking channels. So there's definitely starting to be battle lines drawn as the, the formal financial system starts to understand that this concept of decentralization and private free moving money is something that people want so it could be a real threat to their actual industry. So on the other side of the coin, that's the sort of view of what's going on in the centralized space and where the lines are being drawn, you've got the other movement towards self-sovereignty, which is definitely the space that Bitcoin crypto is currently playing in in its current format. So this gentleman over here, John Father Perry, he was one of the founders of the original internet. I think the internet had its 50th birthday this year, so it seems like a good time to talk about it. And what I found profound about his original Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace speech was how aligned those values are to the values of the current cryptocurrency industry. It was all about independence and self-sovereignty and about the individuals being able to get back against the man, whether the man be a big government or be big business. It was about very much putting power and control into individuals' hands. So because those values do align so much about what the decentralized economy is trying to do, it's also worth looking at what happened since then. Because as we all know, as humans that navigate in the digital and physical world today, that isn't exactly how the internet ended up. Rather, what's ended up with the internet currently is that we've seen power and money concentrate into very, very few big business hands or into big government hands, if you're looking at the previous few slides that I took you through over there. So I want to leave Perry over here as a bit of a warning to our industry, and also as a bit of a challenge to say, what can we do to make sure that the crypto industry remains decentralized and doesn't fall into a trap of becoming more centralized down the line? So like some ways that it could become more centralized would be doing things like private currencies, like your Facebook Libra coins, all the rest of it which sound decentralized but really aren't. So they're kind of a bastardization of the concept of what the original Bitcoin manifesto was, which really was a dissident tech manifesto. So dissident tech is quite a big trend at the moment. It's all about technology that people are using to fight back against the man once again. So from everything from the physical space, we're having protesters in Hong Kong downloading apps that can broadcast basically a screen print onto their face to keep them out of facial recognition systems. It's basically like a personal projector to change your face so don't let away masks, for example. That would be an example of dissident tech. You've also got people like Joshua Broder, 
who was developing a whole lot of different apps to help the little man get back money from big corporations. So his company is called Do Not Pay, and he's got a whole host of different apps. Apps that will do everything from giving you free trial credit cards so that you never have to pay, so it's like a fake credit card number that you can put into a subscription company, so that you, know, you don't get accidentally bald three or six months down the line when you've forgotten what you did with your details. It's got other apps that help you claim back claims from airlines if your flight's been delayed, for example. But I really like this concept of dissident tech, but once again, technology is always amoral, it's not immoral or moral, it's how we use it and what we do with it. So once again, I want to put that challenge out to all of us, is to think about how we are using these de decentralized currencies like Bitcoin and all the different cryptocurrencies we can now trade. Are we using them to further our self-sovereignty and independence, or are we using them in a way to actually you know, repeat the mistakes of the past and perhaps re-centralize things going forward? Now, related to this point is probably the most profound sort of understanding that I've had of this whole concept this year. And that's the fact that the whole world as we know it, its default setting is centralization. Its default setting is submit to the status quo, you know, obey the rules of the government, play by the fiat monetary system rules, all the rest of it. If you want to become a part of the decentralized economy, it requires a proactive choice to opt out of the status quo. And behavioral economics tells us that most people will be happy with the default setting. Very few people are prepared to take that step to step out and to deliberately choose to become a part of basically the financial resistance, which is what this is all about right now. And, and that's a challenge for us, because if you want the decentralized economy to grow, you have to go out there and be a bit of an evangelist, which is kind of apt, given that we are sitting here in a church tonight. <laughs> we are talking about things like belief and evangelism. I feel like I sort of a few hallelujahs in there. <laughs> but, any, but anyway, that, that, that really is the point. That you have to be proactively involved in this industry. It's not easy. We all know there are challenges in the crypto space. It's, it's not as easy to open up a new Bitcoin account and take your head around how this whole system works as it is to just open a bank account or stick with your bank that you've always had for the rest of your life. It does require proactive activity, but it's probably worth it in the end if we want to have a more decentralized, more self-sovereign future. But of course, whether we want to or not is definitely up to all of us. And the reason I say that is because the world as we know it right now is a horribly unequal place. The 26 richest individuals in the world are worth as much as the bottom 50% of the world's population. So that's quite a chilling statistic. When we start talking about things like decentralized economies, it would be disingenuous for us to not think about the challenges of inequality at a global level. And the reason I say this is going back to that previous slide when I spoke about decentralization being an opt-out choice. If you are someone in that bottom 50% of the world, and you're reliant on a government welfare grant that is funded by taxation, are you going to be likely to choose to opt out of the system? Realistically, probably not. We more privileged people sitting here in this room. And we have to be aware of this as we start to play with these new technologies going into the future, is to understand that other people's motivations might be the same as yours. If we want to build an inclusive, decentralized economy going forward, we might have to be a little bit less selfish with the way that we're approaching these technologies. If you think that that whole concept of inequality or something doesn't affect you, because there you are, you are definitely, let's admit it, on the more privileged side of the spectrum, the very fact that we're here tonight. If you want to look at those bunk beds over there, what, there are four of those bunk beds in that picture, and each individual one of those bunk beds rents in San Francisco to young professionals for the low, low price of 20,000 rand a month. You get a bunk bed. That's it. So I really do want to encourage you just to think maybe perhaps a little bit more systemically about the future of money and about the real issues going on in the world. Of course, to follow on that thought, I'm sure most of you have come across Andrew Yang. He is running for the Democratic nomination for the United States presidential race, and he's running on the ticket of vote for me and I'll give you free money. So I mean, like, you know, it's like I'm voting, running for class president saying vote for me and I'll put cake in the cafeteria. It's kind of a no-brainer choice. But he's really appealing to people that are struggling with inequality issues, like the young people who are renting bunk beds from Fudshare for the price of an entire salary. And his competitor, Elizabeth Warren, has been putting out her mic saying things like billionaire tears, going very dramatically after the very privileged, very wealthy people in the economy. So 
So I've said if we want to get mainstream adoption for decentralized currencies, we have to find a way to align the values with the sort of people that are going to be voting for these two players. But on that note, this is um, Nassim Talib. He is the author of The Black Swan and various other quite well-known economics books. And I want to draw attention to his concept of how minorities change the world. And he writes it from a more negative connotation about the fact that, you know, if you've got just one person who's allergic to, say, gluten in a family, the whole family ends up switching to, you know, disgusting gluten-free pizza bases because, you know, it's too much effort to cook two meals because of the one kid with an allergy. And once that family has adopted the gluten-free lifestyle, Every time they go to a picnic or go to a class event, they also bring in gluten-free cake. And soon the whole class is now having to eat gluten-free food. And then the local groceries find out, oh, this, these guys, like there's a couple of families now buying gluten-free products. So let's just make the whole bakery section gluten-free because the gluten-free guys can't buy the gluten bread, but the gluten guys really can eat the gluten-free variety. So that's his concept of how minority ideas and minority opinions and positions in economics and in politics are actually the ideas that change the world. So when it comes to decentralized economy, that can play in our favor or against it. Do we want to be the minority that refuses to accept the rules of the current system? Or are we going to be beaten back by the people who are insisting on things like universal basic income? So once again, it's just a challenge to put out there, a different way to think about changing the world, particularly with very difficult concepts like cryptocurrency. In Egypt, the small shop is king. This is where Egyptians do the majority of their grocery shopping. Here, it's common practice for the shopkeeper to substitute small change with low-value items, the kind of stuff you find next to his cash register, like gum or candy. In fact, this practice is so widespread, nearly anything can act as change, even if you end up feeling, well, short change. Why did we pay him? What's going on? This is when Vodafone wanted to introduce micro-recharge cards for their prepaid users, we spotted an opportunity. Now, prepaid cards are targeted at people with low disposable income, and these represent over 90% of Vodafone users in Egypt. And these guys also happen to be small shops' main customers. So we thought, well, what if we positioned these cards as small change and made them available in all small shops? With the micro recharge cards different denominations, we created a new currency. We gave this currency an actual name, Fakka, Egyptian for small change, and we designed the cards in such a way that they could fit the cash register's compartment where change is normally kept. In doing so, we moved prepaid recharge cards from designated outlets to every little shop in the country and turned the cards from an item on the shopping list to an everyday item. The results, well, they speak for themselves. So I showed you that just to show that when we're going ahead, looking ahead now to what the future of money is, to change tack for one last time for the last part of this talk, and that is really anything can go going forward. When we're looking at the future of money in a world where there are no rules, when even the fiat economy is not behaving by its own rules, it's designed for itself, we're really heading into a world where the future of money is not necessarily one thing, but many things. Sure, yes, there'll be some winners and some not, but definitely the internet has given us a certain degree of decentralization and that we do have more choices now. We do have a choice between using a cryptocurrency and using a fiat currency for a lot of our transactions. And those choices are only going to grow. So one of my favorite examples locally here is the team behind Project Fubu or Project UBU. They are creating also a new currency out of thin air based purely on belief, just like Bitcoin has been done. But they're also tying into a lot of those concepts of a more socially just future like the ideas put forward by the likes of Andrew Yang, in that Project Ubu is a free market, voluntarily funded, universal basic income currency. And it's a cryptocurrency. So you can sign up on the app and they give you free money every day. Not a lot, just enough to buy a few basic items. And they're trying to be quite clever in that by issuing these credits that created this new currency that has no intrinsic value, but it has value as long as people are using it. 
and they're trying to tie it into the formal economy by encouraging retailers to instead of giving their CSI budgets to a charity, to rather ring fence a certain portion of their stock to be sold and traded using the Ubu currency. So in that way they're building a link between this imaginary sort of new digitized black market economy with the real world economy. So that's just one example of another sort of alternative currency that is coming on board in the new future of money. Another new sort of currency monetary concept that is being thrown around at the moment is the concept of data should be classified as a form of labor and actually used as a form of currency in and of itself. In that a lot of corporations obviously profit from your data. In fact, your government is also probably selling a lot of your personal data to advertisers, as we found out today from a few of the press releases that came out from the United States. But what Gavin Newsom on the board behind me there is the governor of California, and he says that data should be or categorized as labor, meaning that any company that profits from selling your data or advertising to you based on hyper-personalized data profiles should have to compensate you for that. So it's just another concept of what money could be. Maybe money is actually going to be decoupled with time. So maybe, maybe currency is no longer a cash because in the virtual world it really can be anything that you believe has value. And then we heard a bit earlier tonight about private currencies and private central banks. I think some of the other issues that perhaps weren't addressed earlier when it comes to things like Libra coin, which is a privatized but also rather centralized cryptocurrency, is that if it was to play out the way that Mark initially planned to do it, so we're not sure it's going to happen at this point in time, you'd be buying such vast quantities of real world currencies that you could actually make or break entire fiat systems. So he's going to back, or he's planned to back his cryptocurrency with a basket of real world fiat currencies. And because he has so many users, if theoretically all the Facebook and WhatsApp users joined his little currency, he'd have almost 3 billion people on that plan. That's enough people to move real markets. So that's talking about a real privatized central bank that's probably as privatized and centralized as you can really get. But also speaking of private currencies, there are a lot of private currencies going on in the world today outside of that that we're actually already using. Things like Discovery Vitality that now has points tied to bank accounts and to your health and to your insurance and your driving ability. That's a currency at the end of the day. It has real value and you're trading it. And private currencies can be extrapolated to much bigger levels when you start talking about people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk wanting to put sort of spaceships in the sky. They could have their own currencies for their off-planet settlements that will be entirely controlled by those private for-profit companies. That's just another sort of future that we could be looking at, where you're working with private currencies and public currencies at the same time. What we're really getting into is kind of a Cambrian explosion of what money is. So we've got all these different branches heading off. Some of them will, of course, go extinct further down the line, as we've seen with cryptocurrencies and tokens themselves, and they were launched, but how few of them have been successful in the long run. We're only going to see more of that not just in terms of cryptocurrencies, but in all these different things that are going to be considered money, considered value, in a world where the formal financial system is kind of losing a lot of the trust that is made at the backbones of our economy. And then you've got Jeffrey Tucker over there, he's also one of my favorite guys in the crypto space. I used to work with him in my old company. And he's quite passionate about the fact that when it comes to cryptocurrencies in particular, we can start to look at things like cause-based currencies. So in fact, I've got a few friends here in South Africa also thinking about different ways to think about the economy and to think about the fact that maybe you have an alternative to Bitcoin that every time you trade it donates a few, a, a percentage of that currency towards a cause that you care about. So something like climate change or whether you care about female rights across in Rwanda, whatever the case may be. He sees a world where you don't just have one currency, you don't just have one Bitcoin, rather you have many currencies and the currency that you use or reflect your personal value system. So that's a bit speculative, but actually that's already what's happened with something like Bitcoin. If you are choosing to transact or pay salaries or get paid in Bitcoin, you're making a choice about your values and about which system, which future you want to be a part of going forward. If you're making those same purchases using rands or dollars, you are backing that particular system. So that's definitely a way to think about how we use our money. And then just to put another speculative feature out there, because it is kind of my job, I've got another friend called Mathana Stanter. He's an ethicist that's based in Germany at the moment, and he envisages a world beyond money altogether, where theoretically we'll evolve enough as a species to be able to get along without competitive economics, 
and to just get along with each other and almost live in a voluntary sort of kibbutz type system perhaps on the stars beyond Mars. So he's got a campaign going on to say no money beyond Mars. We shouldn't have musk bucks, bucks flying across the sky if we ever get to Mars. Rather, we should think about a new way to exist amongst each other off planet Earth, Earth itself. Perhaps beyond the scope of this discussion, definitely worth putting out there as there are no rules going ahead, so we really can't have anything. Either way, the question really is for all of us that whether we go head towards a utopia or a dystopia, it's up to us, it's up to us to vote, as I said, with our wallets and with our actual votes for the future that we do want to live in. And I quite like the concept of the fact that there is no one size fits all utopia anyway. Perhaps there should be more than one worldview that we use going forward. Perhaps it doesn't have to be only Bitcoin forever going ahead. Perhaps there can be more than one different currencies that can as, as Jeffrey Tucker says, attached to our own individual unique value systems. And just to end off with, how do we do that once we have decided which sort of future money we want to live in? Well, I like to come back to the, as I said, we are standing here in a church, so it is very apt, but to end on this slide, I didn't know that when I put this together. But money and religion have a lot in common. They're both based on belief. They're not based on necessarily anything tangible that we can prove. But at the same time, just like religion, ideas about money and value can't easily be crushed. Something like a decentralized network like the Bitcoin network actually becomes stronger the more nodes are attached. That's the way decentralized networks work. And as Sophocles says, you can kill a man, but you can't kill an idea. So perhaps we all leave here tonight with an idea that you're passionate about and want to put forward into the future. We just have to understand that we need to be proactive about it going forward because otherwise the status quo will continue as long as we can kick that can down the road. Thank you. Bronwyn, thank you so much. I think all of our minds are pretty blown right now. And I'm very excited to wear my fake jeans on Mars much sooner than I think we can expect. Okay, I have some cool news. Um, everyone here, at the end of tonight is going to receive either a Luno cap or a Luno shirt when you leave, um, but only right at the end. Please ensure that you have your sticker display. Like I said, we're not going to allow anyone back in who doesn't. I um, also want to let you know you can buy Bitcoin shirts and caps from Kevin at the back. Where's Kevin? Over there? Yeah. Um, he also some, donated some of the prizes earlier. And you can also buy crypto hardware wallets from Crypto Vault over there. At the back, he's been KZN's leading hardware wallet supplier for two years and is selling his wallets at Black Friday specials this evening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to give you guys just a five minute break to go to the bathroom and grab another drink before we carry on with our next speaker. Good morning. Okay, bring it back with you. That's motion. Oh.
ladies and gentlemen, to start taking your seats again, please. We're going to start again shortly. company with its head office in London and also our partner for this evening. He joined Luno in 2016 and helped the company grow from a group of 10 to a global team of 300 people across three continents. Marius wholeheartedly shares his company's philosophy of being on a mission to upgrade the world to a better financial system. He believes in finding solutions to safe and easy cryptocurrency purchases and transactions around the world. Marius is a Chartered Management Accountant and holds an Honours Degree in Management Accounting from the University of Stellenbosch. Tonight, using his experience at one of the largest cryptocurrency exchanges in the world, Marius is going to look at how cryptocurrencies fit into the future of money. Actually, it's my first time in Durban since between 2003 or 2004 uh, when I played in a cricket tournament at Yildon. Um So quite a shocking stat. Um, <laughs> but, it's, but it's nice being here and, and 15, 16 years later I'm here and I'm speaking about magic internet money, which is quite, uh, quite interesting. But um, yeah, so thanks for, 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 for being here tonight. Really, it's already past eight and we're only two-fifths through the presentation. So thanks for sticking around. Um, we are very proud to be associated with uh, SwiftX, with SA Crypto, so thanks to Kirsty uh, for being the MC, and thanks to James for Andrew Meese from Uno for having all the logistics here tonight, and for the nice swag, and for the awesome venue, really appreciate that. Um, 
So as, as Kirsty said, um, I've been at Leno since 2016. Um, we currently operate across 14 markets technically. We have offices across seven, seven countries. I'm based in Johannesburg. Um, I'm a Captonian and I've been in Johannesburg for, for one year now. Um, we have our Captain office, which is our, our global operations team or mothership, and we have a team of 230, 40 people there. Um, they look after our operations. Um, so we have our finance team there, we have our customer support team there, compliance, fraud, all those operational teams. And then the Jovic team is our African HQ, so, so that team focuses on growth, on events like this, and also focusing on our African expansion plans. Um, we have an office in London, but we also have teams in Lagos, building an office in Kenya and Nairobi, and also Singapore, uh, Malaysia, and Indonesia, so global business. Um, but I'm not here to talk about Luno tonight. Um, um, hopefully, at the very least, if you don't own cryptocurrency yet, hopefully after tonight you'll go and you'll install the Luna app and you'll take that first step and maybe dip your toes into crypto by buying 20 or 30 rands and, and just get started that way. Um, so, I think, do I have the ticket? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Just, okay, so, over the past thousands of years, the way the world thinks about and uses money has changed a couple of times. Um, and the only constant throughout really is, is change. Um, and, and we're currently in the process of, of going through another change. Um, and, and the only difference really is that this time is happening right in front of our eyes and we are all part of, of this change. The change that, that Ronan spoke about and the change that, that we'll, we'll cover later throughout this presentation. But why are we seeing this change? Why are we all here? Why do we have cryptocurrency exchanges? Why do we have the media reporting about cryptocurrency like it's the, the, the next big thing, why do we have re regulators coming into the fore, putting regulations into place? And I think that's for three reasons. Firstly, there's a mindset change. So at a foundational level, a very important aspect of money is the mental construct around it, right? We've been using money or we use money in a certain way because that's how we've been taught, right? But it doesn't mean that we have to use money in that same way going forward. So, so even if Bitcoin fails tomorrow or five or 10 years time, I think it would have served its purpose because it enabled us to reimagine uh, a future financial system. Secondly, changing consumer needs. So the world's consumers have changed dramatically in terms of behavior, uh, in terms of, of demographic, um, and consumers have become more tech savvy. They demand things free, must be instant, um, and it must be customized according to their needs. Um, and, and, and it's not different for, for money. And, and thirdly, we have a new technology, and technology is usually the enabler um, for us to, to meet change or to satisfy change. Right? And just by way of example, when we first went from, from physical gold coins or rand coins to banknotes, the technology there was watermarking, right? So, so the watermark in the banknote is very, serves a very specific purpose because that distinguishes a legitimate note from a fraudulent note or a forged note, right? So, so in this case, we have Bitcoin, which is a new technology, um, and Bitcoin will allow us to achieve the economies of, economies of scale that these consumers demand from us. So I want to take you back to 1996. Um, it was an important year for a number of reasons. Um, I think I was still in primary school, so I didn't, I didn't, didn't know this, but um, I remember a couple of things from my, from my youth, and one was, 95 World Cup, which was significant. Um, and then in 2000, 1996, Tabo Mumbeki delivered his I'm an African speech, um, which we talked about the African Renaissance, basically. And, and what it focused on was um, Africans putting together uh, to overcome the huge challenges around poverty, to, to, to uplift people out of poverty. Um, and he borrowed some of the thoughts there from a couple of other people. First, Sheikh Ante Diop. He's a Senegalese. Uh, he first started writing about the African Renaissance back in the 1940s. And before him, Marcus Garvey, who's a Jamaican, and he was an activist um, in the US. Uh, he actually he was a mentor to, um, to Martin Luther King. And he started writing about the United States of Africa back in the 1920s. Um, so, so, so these three heavyweights, all of them wrote about the same things, and it was how do we move Africa forward? How do we collaborate to move Africa forward? Um, and an important thing that, that all of them touched on essentially was um, that human progress is largely driven by collaboration, consolidation, 
and economies of scale. And that is no different for, for money, really. Um, it's in our nature. It's an inevitable, inevitable, inevitable part of the development of society. A couple of examples. Firstly, how we moved from little villages to nation states, where people decided to pool together resources to build armies, for example. Um, after that, technology. So think of Google, think of the Facebooks of the world. Um, are they pulled together resources to create new operating systems? All of us use either Android or, or we use iOS. Um, and, and, and I think just from there, money is no exception. Consolidation is, is inevitable. So if you look at this graph and you look at the, the pink dot right at the bottom, that represents the, the current fiat system as we know today. So it's, it's fiat money that's issued, and Graham covered this excellently, it's fiat money that is issued by government, but that's not backed by anything physically. If we zoom out a bit and we look at that, that graph there, you'll see that we've actually seen some collaboration from a money perspective over the past couple of years. So you'll see all the common monetary areas there. You'll see the South African development community. Um, you'll see the yellow area in blue at the top, um, which is all the SIPA countries. You'll see all the dollar countries um, in lime green to the left, um, Australian dollar to the right. So for some part of, of of recent history, we've had this collaboration between different countries. In fact, I, I got an email this week from my financial advisor saying that you know you can't move money freely between South Africa and Namibia and the other Southern African countries. You know, it's, it's now seen as remittance actually. So that's one step back for us in, on that front. But um, but then if you go back to 1792, that is when the Coinage Act came into effect, and that is where governments for the first time um, issued. Uh, money backed by physical assets like gold, silver at the time. So if you look at the, the dates, it's actually part of recent history. It's not that long ago. If you, if, you, if you look back over the past thousands of years, you will see that if that block represents time, you will see that the current system as we know, it's only part of recent history really. Um, so 600 years before Christ, people have already started using gold coins and silver coins uh, to exchange value and, and to, to buy so what's important here is that for, for the most part of humanity, we've actually already been using a global financial system. We've been using coins, um, and, 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 and the, the current system has only really been used. So it, it shouldn't be that, that out there. Two examples, uh, one is the US dollar, um, the other one is the euro. Examples of countries or, or groups of countries who came together to consolidate. Um, and and, and the, the, the benefits or the impact in terms of, of cross-border trade um, is, is, is visible there. So, so what, will a, what can a universal financial system for Africa look like? Um, or what, what impact can it have on Africa? So, so firstly, if you look to the left, you'll see remittances. So the remittance volumes for Africa for 2019 is estimated to, to reach 40 billion US dollars, and that is only for retail clients. That excludes B2B, excludes business uh, transfers, and also excludes um, remittances from Africa outwards to other, to other continents. So the average fee for a remittance usually is, let's say, 10%, sometimes even more than that. So if you do the calculation, you see that 4 billion US dollars of fees um, gets lost to the system, to intermediary players, collecting all those monies. And that is a shocking stat. Secondly, e-commerce, so that's people buying goods online using their credit cards, their credit cards. Um, the e-commerce market uh, in the, over the next two to three years is expected to hit 30 billion US dollars. Again, on a for-card payment, when you do an online purchase, you pay 2.5 to 3% fees for that. You don't always pay the fee. In most cases, the, um, the, the merchant will cover that fee. But again, 3% of that, that's 1 billion US dollars that's lost in the system and it gets allocated to intermediary partners. Thirdly, uh, financial inclusion. So, what cryptocurrency can do from a financial inclusion perspective across Africa? Let's put one trillion dollars to that because most for most parts of Africa, people do not have access to bank facilities. So there is no deposit um, deposit bank. Um, interoper interoperability. It's tough to put a number on that, but um, the studies that, that, that suggested that when systems become interoperable, then the throughput of the money money flow to the system increases. Capital controls. So again, studies suggested that when you open borders um, and when you can transfer funds freely, uh, freely across borders, uh, uh, trade should increase by 50 to 52 percent for those markets. ID theft and cybercrime. So that is your credit card being hacked. We've been current, for example. Um, that topped 
3.5 billion US dollars in 2017. So again, another 3.5 billion dollars that's lost to the system because of systems that we use that's susceptible to fraud. Um, so again, the, the comparison between a card payment or credit card versus cryptocurrency, which is completely secure. Um, top left, investment currency stability. So that's countries like Venezuela, like Zimbabwe, with, with extreme volatility in, in their local currencies. It's negative inflation. Obviously, tough to put a number to that, but that's significant. And then there are a couple of other things, and, and, and those are things that that three studies being done on, on the euro, for example, came, came to the fore, and that is things like better price transparency, uh, cross-board employment, simplified billing, expanding markets, trade, uh, financial stability, lower interest rate, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's evident by looking at, at this and adding up all the, all the costs here that the impact on Africa or any continent for that matter, if you consolidate money, consolidate the way you use money is significant. And, and, and I think um, the impact on Africa can be significant. So where does all the value go? Short answer, it goes to the end consumer. It all, everything accrues to the end consumer, you, you and me uh, transacting. Um, if you, again, if you use an example of, of, of the internet and technology, for example, uh, emails uh, or, or the internet, um, people can now send an email by the click of a, of a, of a button. They don't have to pay postage fees. So in that instance, the, the money accrued to, to, the, to the end consumer and the same can happen for money. So let's imagine we look at cryptocurrency for Africa and the impact that crypto can have on Africa and also why we think that cryptocurrency can play an important part here. Firstly is political will or the lack of political will amongst countries to collaborate and to form these common monetary areas. Um, certain countries, actually back in 2009 when Muammar Gaddafi he was the chairman of the African Union, I couldn't believe this when I read it, um, but he was the chairman and he actually proposed a, again, the United States of Africa concept where he said, listen, why don't we create a single passport, why don't we create a single currency for Africa? Um, and it was shut down because there's no political will. And to some degree, I understand that because certain countries, some of the small countries, um, are in conflict, conflict with other markets. Um, some of the stronger countries said no, we'll have to pull more weight in this, this instance. So there's no political will for, um, for, for this change to come from a bottom up angle. Um, and that is why we think if there's adoption in cryptocurrency, and there will be, it'll come from a grassroots level. So you and I and consumers will drive this adoption from the ground up. When someone uses cryptocurrency for a specific reason and where they find it useful to use cryptocurrency for that reason, um, they will use it. And we conducted research recently that, that, that showed that um, people in emerging markets, um, where they depend on money for their livelihood, where they depend on money to put their children through school, they actually tend to become more creative and finding ways to maximize their return on their, on their funds. So in this case, we're seeing higher adoption levels, even on Luno. Luno's clients in the emerging markets, that is South Africa, Nigeria, um, Indonesia, we're seeing higher uptick in signups and in higher uptick in deposits compared to our customers in Europe for, for that matter. So, so, so why cryptocurrency? There's some urine characteristics that will make cryptocurrency a better vehicle for this. Firstly, it's open, so anyone can use it. Anyone can innovate it. Secondly, it's neutral. So a Bitcoin is a Bitcoin, whether it's in Russia, whether it's in Venezuela, whether it's in the US. Um, there's no sort of question around that. There's no government saying, hey, but what about this, what about that? It's a neutral unit. It's auditable. So it can actually weed out corruption, specifically in Africa. It's completely transparent on the blockchain. Everything is there to see, completely auditable. It's trusted. So, so now we, instead of depending on third parties and intermediaries, we depend on uh, cryptography and we depend on protocols to process transactions. So there's no trust required. It's secure and it's also versatile. So crypto can be used for investments, whether you're a sophisticated investor, whether you're a trader speculating in the short run, um, whether you want to buy cryptocurrency to hedge against uh, uh, geopolitical um, instability, uh, whether you want to use cryptocurrency for payments, um, we've seen advances being made from a payments perspective of Lightning Network, um, we've seen new changes coming or new use cases like stable coins meant to uh, remove or reduce the volatility in the, in the unit price of cryptocurrency, um, and, and that, that leads to cryptocurrency's versatility. Um, 
and, and, and for these reasons, we think that the change in, in financial system and, and the adoption of government grant level up, I think one of the issues we, we're sitting with is, is that of instant gratification. We all expect cryptocurrency to instantly be, or by Friday, be better than the existing financial system. But the reality is, the existing system was built up over hundreds of thousands of years. So yes, cryptocurrency can one day be a better store of value. Yes, it can bring down the cost of cryptocurrency. Yes, it can be more secure, but it is going to take some time, and I think we need to be patient. So, so let's just look at sort of the timelines of how we see this playing out, and we think there will be a 10 to 20 year time period. Firstly, um, currently we're in the asset phase, where people buy cryptocurrencies for speculative purposes, for, for investments, and this is extremely useful because the asset layer or the asset phase actually builds the infrastructure for the for the transaction layer. Um, a, a good example of this is three or four years ago, we um, were had a meeting with a, a browser. I think I can't remember who it was, but but so so they had people visiting that that, that, that website. No, it was a news news publication, um, and but they had a they had a paywall. I think it was the Financial Times, maybe. So, so you really get like one free article a month, and then you have to register and, and put in your credit card details essentially to, to continue reading that publication. So we said, listen, what if we put an extension on the browser and the client can tap on that, whether it's a Reno logo or whether it's whatever, Coinbase logo, and just by the tap, you go through the paywall and you can read the article. And the publication said, okay, but how many customers do you have? And I think at the time we had, let's say 50,000 clients, and they said, okay, well, so it's a good idea, but you don't have you don't have economies of scale. You don't have enough people wanting or enough people who will be able to use that. So we said fine enough. Um, and, and, and that highlighted the, the fact that, that you need more people transacting and more people using Bitcoin for payments to be able to to um, to build and to be able to, to see that the transaction phase sort of being being used more. But the interesting thing is so um, so even though our three million clients, most of them buy Bitcoin for, 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 for investments, if you give them the option to click on that extension on the, the browser and to go through that paywall, most of them will probably do that, right? So again, it highlights the importance of, of people coming to the system, buying cryptocurrency for investment purposes and helping us to build the infrastructure for, for, for more widespread adoption. And then lastly is the sort of decentralized, and that's just this fuzzy future essentially. I think people tend to try and front run innovation and worry too much about future use cases, future things. I think the biggest challenge we have at this stage is, is sort of from an educational perspective. Um, we are probably eight or nine people in the room here. Um, if you walk out of this property of the street, the first person you ask them, hey, do you know about Bitcoin? They will say yes, but they will think it's a scam probably. Right? So, so the, education, the educational aspect is probably the most important one for us now to, to focus on instead of trying to figure out future use cases and, and build sort of future use cases. So I think it's important to touch on the risks. Uh, it's a new technology. It's only been around for a decade, really. So looking at the risks, firstly, nefarious use, and that is money laundering, obviously. Uh, volatility, so price movements in a short space of time. Um, scaling, so the system not being optimized or the throughput of the system not optimized for, for, for large volumes of payments at this stage compared to Visa and MasterCard and those systems. Regulation, uh, prime example is F&B, right? So, so without regulations, you're seeing banks um, acting as de facto regulators and, and they think that they can regulate the market themselves. So without regulations, we will see more and more of these. In fact, um, we've experienced this in all our markets except South Africa. So this FME incident in South Africa was the first time we, we've experienced this in South Africa. But in Nigeria, we've lost two bank accounts. In Singapore, we lost an account. In Malaysia, we lost two bank accounts. We shut down our operations for two years, and we got a license two weeks ago, and we're operating there again two years later. Indonesia, we lost a bank account. So it's one of the biggest challenges that the industry is sitting with, right? Getting access to bank partners to build the on-ramps for users to solve that issue of using your fiat currency, your RANDs, to buy Bitcoin or to buy Ethereum. And then lastly, education. I think when the price rallied in 2017, um, none of the exchanges really put in the effort to educate their clients. The uh, consumers, uh, they were driven by greed and they, they just bought Bitcoin and got into the market without really understanding what it is that they're buying. So the education element is still really important and that is one of the risks. 
If you look at the mitigation, sorry, it's, no, it's difficult to read there. Um, from money laundering perspective, we have more transparency now, we have technology that we use uh, to analyze the liberty to monitor transactions. And if you compare, and I know people often do this comparison where they compare um, illicit flows to cryptocurrency, illicit, illicit flows to the FDR system, but, but that is a fact, right? If people, so, so, so there is, in the crypto market, there is this, there's this zero appetite. So whenever there's, whenever, whether it's a $10 or $5 transaction that's used to buy, to buy weed, then people will say, oh, I told you so, that happened, right? Um, and, and that is the case. So there's absolutely zero tolerance. But the fact is, if they don't use crypto, they will go to the nearest ATM, draw cash, and buy that weed, and they will smoke it. And they will probably enjoy it and get out. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, so we tell the, the banks, listen, but we're regulators, but I mean, it, it, it happens, right? And then they will say, okay, but, um, but ah, they will say, okay, they go to the ATM and they draw cash, and they just buy the bloody thing. But okay, it's not, not our ATM, they will say, right? And then, so no, well, they actually use your ATM also, right? But that's not the point. The point is that uh, the illicit flows and, and used through, through the fiat system is much bigger than, than cryptocurrency. Volatility. So the volatility has come down slightly. Um, we've seen things like stable coins, which is paid to a basket of currencies or physical gold or whatever. Um, it's meant to break down the volatility. Scaling. We have developments like SegWit, like the Lightning Network, um, that will increase the throughput of payments over the next years to come. The regulation. So in South Africa, for example, we have pragmatic regulators that are very close to putting regulations into, into place. Um, the, the best in Africa for that matter, I think, and it will be some of the leading sort of policies and thoughts that, that we've seen around the world. So regulation is becoming better. I mean, education, um, I think it's important. I think we've seen less bias press. So, so compared to three, four years ago, so very informed press, um, that's helping the cause. And I think we're also seeing more efforts from exchanges and crypto providers to educate the market, to, ed to educate the clients, which is, which is a good thing. But the important part of this is that we've built all of these applications for controls over the past five years. We can't really say 10 years, because 10 years ago, Bitcoin only came into existence and you could buy a pizza with a Bitcoin. <laughs> So, so we've only, for the past five years, we've known about the currency really, and we've built all these infrastructures. So it's amazing. Just imagine what we can do and achieve over the next 10 years, right? So, um, so we can just get the banks to hang on for another six months or one year. So we have more controls in place, then that would be amazing. Um, so the industry typically think of the currency, or the other people think of it as the wild west, right? They think we are cowboys and we don't care about people's privacy, people's data, or people's money. That's not a cowboy, that's a bandit. Bandits steal people's money, they try and trick people. That is cowboys. So, so cowboys tame wild horses and, and, and bulls. Um, and in our case, the, the horse has really bolted. So the industry is running wildly. And we as exchanges and as the industry needs to build and grow this industry in a responsible way. And that is what we are doing as an exchange. So if I take you back to 1996, and if I show of hands, how many of you had mobile phones back in 1996? Was it a toy phone or an actual phone? Okay, two or three, <laughs> a brick. Did it look like that? Yeah. No, okay. So, so, I mean, back then, the penetration for mobile phones was probably not 1%, probably 0.1%, right? And probably only a couple of people used it. Um, and, and I mean, why would you use a mobile phone if you could have used a landline phone, right? Because everyone had landlines and used it, right? Um, so, um, and, and now, 30 years later, we see market penetration in Africa, more than 90%. So most people in Africa, in Nigeria, actually have more than one phone. They've got two or three phones with four, two SIM cards in each phone, and they've got cheap data. I almost fell on my back when I saw the data prices in Nigeria recently. It's like ridiculous how much we're paying in South Africa. But, but, but 30 years back, so the point I'm trying to make here is that um, we're still very much at the beginning. So look at what happened uh, over the past 30 years for the mobile phone. And if you consider what mobile phones did for freedom of speech, quality, democracy, human rights, free speech, human development uh, in, in, across Africa, compared to what politicians or any other person said or did uh, in government, it's actually stunning to show. Just imagine what the currency can do over the next couple of years, over the next decade, over the two decades. Um, we think change is coming. We think it's coming fast. 
and um, we are very excited about the next couple of years, looking forward to 2020. I think it's going to be an interesting ride, lots of new developments, and on that note, I will end my presentation. Thanks so much. Marius, and I think if, if you haven't got the Luno app already, I'm sure most people in this room, it's like a staple in a lot of, a lot of our phones, but if you don't, really make sure you download it and be a part of one of the top 10 crypto exchanges in the world. Guys, just a reminder that if you have any questions for our speakers, please tweet them with the hashtag futuremoneysa. You can also tweet, tweet something completely random if you want to, because we do have prizes to give, give away to anyone who does tweet with the hashtag. I have had the privilege of working with our last speaker over the last year or so. Nick Allen, you just kind of, within his vicinity, you feel like your IQ is raised. Yeah. Nick studied electronic engineering at the University of KwaZulu Natal, where he went on to complete his master's. He immediately went to work at automotive engineering firm PFK Electronics, where he grew through the ranks to executive of research and development. After 10 years with PFK, Nick saw the huge opportunities in blockchain and digital assets, and together with other IT and engineering professionals, he founded Avancor, where he is now the CEO. Using Avancor's data from over a dozen exchanges around the world and the numerous blockchains, Nick is going to give us an overview of what the current state of the crypto asset market is right now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Nick. I've been introduced. Thank you very, very much, Casey, for that. And we work out how to use this. So, firstly, um, fungi and fungibility. No, this has not got to do with my pool, which I've still not figured out, but it was prompted by my search to work out how to get a transparent pool. It is, however, prompted by this guy, which is Mark Corazel Fungi. Now, I stumbled across a TED talk when searching for the ultimate solution to my pool. Um, I stumbled across this mycorrhizal um, fungi, and it was through an evolutionary biologist by the name of Toby Kears. Now, just follow me for a second. I'd like you just to visualize um, this, this ecosystem that consists of plants and consists of fungi and the symbiotic relationship between them. So basically, what she went along and uh, explained is um, this economy is almost 450 million years old. This is an economy that exists between plants and fungi. And it is so ubiquitous that it exists across almost every ecosystem globally. And it's so huge that it collects literally millions of traders. However, these are not economic traders. These are traders that are bartering for nutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen, sugars, and carbon. So it is a non-mechanical, conscious attempt to optimize and spread um, nutrients from high-density areas to low-density areas. 80% of plants in the world live with a symbiotic relationship. Either have a symbiotic relationship with this mycorrhizal fungi. And in the mycorrhizal fungi bonding to roots, the plants manage to obtain almost 700 times greater exposure to the soil, which is something phenomenal. One of the facts that stuck in my head was a thimbleful of soil that contains this fungi has over a kilometer of thread-like roots. A thimbleful of soil. And basically what happens is this sets up a complex network underground. Similar, and I'll get to the point, the complex network in the cryptocurrency market. So going on a little bit further, so how does this actually work? So the mycorrhizal fungi spore germina, germinates and it connects itself to a plant. And not just any particular plant, it actually seeks the plant that can provide it with the most nutrients. So the plant will provide the fungi with carbon and the fungi will provide, provide the plant with phosphorus and nitrogen, which is difficult for the plant itself to absorb through its roots. It then colonizes the root with its thread-like filaments, and it basically establishes a cooperative 
but also a competitive symbiotic relationship between the plant and itself. So this is an example, a nice graphic, um, of that interaction between the <coughs> fungi and the plant itself. And I want to take you on a journey with two parallels that I've found, and I hope that, that they make as much sense as I thought they do. And that is parallel number one, which is um, looking at this fungi and how it sort of grows and establishes an underground ecosystem, the emergence of the crypto assets infrastructure. So over the last eight years, what is the crypto um, infrastructure look like? Exchanges, banks, regulators. And secondly, so the emergence of the cryptographic and evolving of cryptographic infrastructure. And the second one is the convergence of the current incumbents, the current financial incumbents, the current retail incumbents, and this new cryptographic um, development unit. So are there entities that are in the crypto space or individuals that are launching cryptocurrency tokens? Okay, so this is quite interesting. So one of the things that this um, evolution biologist said was we knew that there was this underground ecosystem, but we they didn't understand exactly how it functioned. So as any good scientist would do, they injected radioactive carbon <laughs> into the, the underlying network, and they observed this. So this is you can see that scale 100 micrometers in real time. 16 seconds, 17 seconds, 18 seconds. And what's interesting to note here is that it is not a unidirectional flow of nutrients. It is speeding up, it is slowing down, and it's going one direction, it's going the other direction. And what's actually happening is this fungi is bartering with various plants, and it's transferring information and value, and it has the capability of, if it doesn't feel it's getting a sufficient reward from the plant, it'll actually block the nutrients that it could provide the plant. So it's a very sort of potentially hostile environment, but also potentially symbiotic environment. So parallel number one, the evolution and growth of subterranean crypto infrastructure. So this is the roads and rails that are being established. <clears throat> it will have been established over the last current uh, couple of years, or tens of years, or 10 years, I guess. And how um, I see a parallel with this um, funding. So this isn't too great, but what this is, is this is um, a view, you won't be able to see the resolution, but each column represents a cryptocurrency exchange. And Vancor has 28 servers that are commissioned in the cloud, and it's gathering terabytes upon terabytes of data. It's um, gathering the full bid book, the full ask book, and it's looking at um, market inefficiencies. In this case, the numbers that you would have seen here, and the 4K predictor, would have been the lowest ask price and the highest bid price for well, the same fungible asset, for example, Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin, but on different exchanges. So whilst you have a BHP Billiton that trades on, let's say, um, JC and maybe London Stock Exchange, don't quote me on that, <laughs> Bitcoin trades globally. And that's why this is such an incredible opportunity where you have a fungible asset that trades across multiple geographies, across multiple time zones, across multiple um, order books that are all completely independent. It's a bunch of individuals that are deciding what the price should be and bartering for that essential. So there's this natural natural ecosystem that's trying to find what the common price should be. Going on, um, this is an example of two exchanges where there's a mismatch. So at the bottom there, the blue represents a bid book um, on one exchange, um, I believe it is Luno. And the red represents an ask book, which would be something offshore. I believe it might be Bitstamp. And what you can see here is that there is an inconsistency between those two. So the one, the one geography is overvaluing or undervaluing the price of Bitcoin, and the other geography is overvaluing it. And the particular reason in South Africa is exchange control. It also exists in Indonesia, exists in uh, um, other places, Korea, wherever the exchange control is. Yeah. So this is quite interesting. So now taking that into account, that's a pretty good concept, but this is a, a map of the world. And those dots represent the cell exchange where there are market inefficiencies. So this is this is possibly a subset of three or four terabytes worth of data that we've been storing over the last um, three years. And it's just the last year. So it actually scrolls through from November 2018 through to November 24th yesterday. And what you can see, if you could, is that giant block in the middle is Luna and or Bella and or Ovex. And what you can see is that the 
the, the volume that would be required to normalize the market inefficiencies, there ebbs and flows here. So I'm trying to draw the parallel to this fungi network that's moving to try and transfer nutrients from a high concentration area to a low concentration area, and that kind of bartering. Slightly, slightly different, but just humanly. Um, so, yeah, so there ebbs and flows, and it goes offshore exchanges across each other, so I think exchanges are sort of a common, um, a common phenomenon there. Moving forward, okay, so let's take a little bit of a step back. I dived in there. Um, facts and figures. So those numbers that you saw moving around, um, that was just Bitcoin. Apologies, that was just Bitcoin, and I believe it was just against the USD. So that is just Bitcoin, just against the USD, all of the global uh, exchanges, I think they're 15 or so that we have in that sample set. And if you look at this, this is, as of last evening, the top 10 crypto assets, um, which represent, a, well, they don't, the entire crypto market cap is $194 billion. It's phenomenal. But the 24-hour volume is $76 billion, of which Bitcoin is 66%. So all those little dots you saw moving around and growing and shrinking actually represents 43 billion dollars of movement, of movement of nutrients in the last 24 hours, which is a phenomenal amount. Be it bots or be it people looking to buy weed, whatever it is. <laughs> so just some more facts and figures, because you know, just to try and pay for everyone here, this is a, a graph um, on the traction for ex crypto exchanges. And that, that graph sort of takes off around about, I think it's mid-2018, and it thinks that there's 599 exchanges out. 165 reputable ones, <laughs> sounds more likely. But what's interesting is that there is just this natural growth in exchanges to support the demand from individuals and geographies and time zones. So it's growing naturally in order to kind of sustain itself. So whilst a lot of those won't exist in one year or five years, it's just interesting to see that growth. Another fact that I love to look at is the mining hash rate. So blockchain is secured by miners. Miners have to extend electricity and computing power. So there's a, an economic uh, expense to actually process or validate a transaction. And the more mining power and the more hash rate that is allocated to a particular blockchain, it represents there are more individuals or more entities that are believing in that blockchain or that opinion because they're supporting the continued growth. So there's currently, I think, 100 and, I want to say 112 exo hashes per second of mining power. So that is 111 quintillion hashes performed per second, which is 10 to the power of 60. Um, some more interesting facts. This is the global Bitcoin node distribution. So again, just to visualize a, a global map there, top left would be um, the land of Trump, middle would be Europe and UK, bottom right would be um, Australia, and middle would be Africa. And this is the number of nodes that are currently up and running, or as of last night, 9,395 full nodes that are discoverable. So that means you can actually ping them. Uh, I don't know how many, what percentage that makes up the total um, number of nodes, but that is the infrastructure, yeah? so that is the infrastructure for Bitcoin. If you were running a server in the corner of your office, or you're running some VMs in the cloud, you've got 28 VMs, like we do. This is 9,300 VMs that all have a single goal, or a threefold goal, is to follow the rules, propagate the blockchain, and ensure that the, the transactions are validated correctly. So, Marius, you alluded to this, the scaling issues. Um, this is the growth of Lightning. So Lightning is a layer two protocol on top of Bitcoin. Bitcoin's kind of a bit of a behemoth, been around forever. It's phenomenal at what it does, maybe call it a store of value, digital gold. But Lightning now is an attempt to build a faster, more nimble, cheaper payment network on top of that. So this was the 18th of January, 2018. There were 43 nodes, um, which between them had 68 channels open. So channels are peer to peer connection to facilitate a transfer of Day. And in total, it had $10,000 locked up. Beginning of January. What do you think it's going to look like now? I'm kidding. That's a that's, that's, that's not funny. <laughs> what it actually looks like is that. <laughs> 25th of November, 4,700 nodes from 42, 30,000 channels from 636, whatever it was, and second layer capacity of $5 million. So there's $5 million that have taken 
has been taken off the on-chain Bitcoin network to fund these chains. So what you do is you put down a deposit and then you interact and you step with like one transaction at the end. Um, so phenomenal growth that's just happening naturally. This is another way to visualize the Lightning Network. There are a couple of nodes. You can see I'm just clicking through last night a couple of the, the Lightning nodes and you can see all of the connections that they are facilitating. This is a global phenomenon. So like you've got, it's just this underlying subterranean infrastructure that's just being established and just waiting um, to be leveraged. So I, I had a look at what the highest channel count node there was and I couldn't work it out. But don't get me wrong, I'm not, saying, I'm not particularly sure what they're doing, but they're setting up these roads and rails, waiting for the public to get educated and aware and for um, retail use cases to emerge. Luna has Lightning support, we haven't played with it yet, but they do have in the API. Um, going forward. going to play a role and I'm interested in it but I'm not married to it um, who knows who knows it's seeding I think however for the great financial reset which is going to be in my belief system um, and that's not something I like to use belief systems it's usually something you were given and you never rationalized yourself into so watch them um, but in my assessment of what's going down this is going to be the economic case study for centuries to come and they're going to ask what the damn hell were those clowns thinking um, when they're doing case study of our generation, uh, of how we got here? So um, it's going to be significant and it's coming and it's going to be soon. I need to get that slide picker. Uh, and I'm going to take you through a couple of things on how I think you should play this. There's certain things that I think will happen. I'm going to tie it in a little bit with gold. So we're going to take you around everything. Uh, and I'll finish with crypto and how I think it'll play out uh, with Bitcoin and how we biased ourselves um, broadly and I think you need to have an investment plan I think you probably if you uh, you can have a trading plan um, and you also need almost geo locational plans to go with it um, because if you're constrained by one geography you're also handicapped um, so I left South Africa born and bred South African um, left South Africa in 99 worked in London uh, living in Cyprus I'm now visiting you again in Zimbabwe uh, for six months and I'll be off that because I like to be mobile. I don't trust the control structure and I like to arbitrage not just the great as a bond call we're discussing, really interesting topics. Don't just arbitrage at a trading level, arbitrage at a general level, which could be citizenship, a residency and many other things. Okay, the great financial reset. What am I here to tell you? Uh, potential chronology of events. I think it's important to understand dominoes are going to start falling. Which ones fall first? Because unfortunately, you don't get to just stand in one place and the whole thing bypasses you. It's like stepping stones. I don't know if you ever played the games. If any of you are gamers, you jump on the stepping stone and then that one starts sinking. And then you've got to leap onto the next. There's going to be an element that things are going to go up, down, and there's going to be wild swings. Um, and this is not going to be the faint-hearted. Most people who are going to be passive are going to be de um, devastated by this. In short, my assessment is this is going to be a polarizing event for wealth for individuals. In other words... The uh, ostrich masses that have their heads in the ground are going to get the kick in the jacksie they probably uh, deserve for not managing their financial wealth and trusting governments and other systems. Um, and those that understand and have looked into the crypto space and also know other off assets, off blockchain assets, how to position, will do a whole bunch uh, better. So make sure you're one of those that are a little bit more awake and are considering various uh, aspects. I gone the wrong way, um, or let me try again. Oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. Let's see. Next one. <coughs> Help, check is failing on me already. It's too advanced. <laughs> A simple uh, slide uh, flicker, and I can't do it. There we go. Okay, for well, some of you thinking what collapse or how bad is it, or why is it in just a quick few points. I think most of you are there already on the page, so I'm not going to spend too long preaching to the uh, choir here. Um, but debt. So Reinhardt and Rogoff, uh, we had some economists here today who've done some interesting study. Uh, they are prominent economists, and basically it's accepted that once you get to 90% debt levels, um, adding further debt is become, starts to become counterproductive. Um, I've had to size down the slide pack uh, for the time speaking slot, but in essence, China right now probably getting one dollar uh, GDP growth for every nine dollars of debt created. That's clearly not economic. 
In other words, it's kind of like me selling um, 10 Rand notes here to you for one Rand. It's just a bad, bad deal and you go out of business in time. What else is going to happen? Growth is slowing globally. I'll talk why I say that. It's probably accepted broadly in most uh, areas. Growth is slowing, which dovetails with the excessive GD, uh, debt levels. Um, it's not only government debt, it's corporate debt this time. So subprime was all about um, the, the individuals in subprime housing and then the toxic debt they created. That was supposed to be investment instruments that they introduced into the banking system in the search for yield. Those all uh, went bust. Uh, and they, were, they, were, they were terrible assets and now we're having a different kind of subprime. We've got subprime cars, we've got subprime student loans. I'm talking a lot about the US, so I'm, I'm quite global. It's not going to be all South African here. Some of you will have heard of this. And then there's corporate debt. At the moment, the interest rates are so low that it's worth your while for a corporation to get over leveraged in debt to retire your equity because you pay more in dividends and earnings than you're currently paying on your debt. What does that encourage? It encourages excessive debt. By the way, you've got to remember the people that are agents for these companies, the managements and the CEOs, they're interested in hitting their stuff off options number and bonus. So it's really helpful if you can borrow a whole bunch and give this wall of money that chases up your own market. So you actually have companies like Coca-Cola that are contracting, they're making less money, they've got far more debt and they're worth twice as much than a decade ago. Um, so it's absolutely phenomenal and it's a perversion and it's a perversion as a result of excessive debt. Um, and it's bending out of the genie curve. The corporate elites are getting super rich at your expense, they're getting highly leveraged, they're going to be too big to fail, and when it comes time to bail them out, you're going to be paying, and you never got any of the upside, and they'll never have any of the downside. We've seen this movie before, we saw it in 2008, they're going to run it again on you. Are you going to get it this time before the sequel comes and visits you? It's coming. Okay, spectre of low, zero, and negative interest rates. Great to see it already handled by awesome speakers just before me, by the way. I really enjoyed listening to them all. It's an absolute perversion in Denmark. You can go uh, purchase a house with a mortgage and it automatically reduces. So it's an encouraging of debt. The concept of saving and having a positive carry has been thrown out the window. And one of the key uh, reasons they want to kill cash. One of the key reasons they want to kill cash and create a cashless society for me um, is so that they can bring on negative interest rates. Because as long as you can put something under your mattress and it hasn't got less, if you put 10,000 under your mattress, it'll still be 10,000 unless you've been visited, is on account of the negative interest rate. It's also one of the reasons why gold uh, will play a role as well. I'm going to talk about yield inversion. It's kind of technical and most people's eyes will glaze over. I'm going to explain it in layman's terms. Just if I could do half as well as the gentleman at the back did blockchain, by the way, that was awesome. Thank you. I, I mean, I'm going to steal that one. Um, I, I don't know if you've got IP on it or whatever. But uh, I'm going to do, uh, I'm definitely going to do uh, that one, uh, although my grandma is long gone. Um, yield inversion. So we'll do yield inversion. I'll explain why it's so important and why it's almost 100% indicator. And it's already happened. And I think we're a foot away from falling off into the next uh, pit. Uh, although it's being denied by the talking heads on CNBC, which is a perfect contra indicator because you don't go to there for the truth, do you? Um, so Goldman Sachs, uh, had the broker, the, the banker, Draghi, was in charge. It's typical. Uh, that's where we hire from, apparently, for central bankers. We get one vampire from one vampire institution to run another vampirical institution. Well, now actually they've gone away with that and they've put a complete politician who's non-financial in charge. Um, and it's a lady, nothing about the gender, uh, but she's going to be political rather than financial. And in my view, it's because there's political events coming. In other words, it's no longer be driven by financial and economic events. We're going into a political season in terms of the financial system. The euro in itself structured as a political uh, instrument. You can't have different fiscal policy and uh, static monetary policy for all the different uh, countries. If you have German savers, you, uh, and you have Greek spenders, you can't have the same monetary rate. It was designed to fail, gentlemen, in my opinion. I think people are smart enough to know that. Therefore, once again, I don't trust. And I think we all globally are being synchronized to be over indebted to fail together so that we can have the problem reaction and the subsequent solution that's been planned for us. Um, that might sound a bit radical. I don't know. Maybe I'm a nutter. Uh, by the way, I love uh, I love Nick's speech. I'm not going to take a magic mushroom ever again in the same light uh, after thinking about all those little blockchains I'm swallowing. Um, anyway, uh, non-dollar central banks. So the uh, non-dollar central banks uh, are universally buying gold. 
Why are they doing that? Bulls are a barbaric rally. That's what Warren Buffett told us. That's what everyone's doing. Germany, after 21 years of not buying gold, is now buying gold. And they're asking for their gold back from America. And America says, uh, uh, seven years, please. What? How long does it take to load up a, uh, a boat? Anyway, too much uh, yield comparison. I'm going straight to the yield. I think we've got to cover this. But I'm also, I'm also interested in the political angles that are coming. So uh, also mentioned today was a little bit of the green element, and I call it the watermelon communism that's coming for us. The watermelon communism. Who doesn't want a safer planet? Who doesn't want a more efficient? It's like voting against motherhood. But let me tell you, there's a little sting to this one. You get to pay for it. It's the excuse for new taxes. Um, I have the opinion that oil is largely being killed. We've had uh, the total peak oil demand. I've done a lot of YouTubes on that. By the way, follow the channel, um, the Market Sniper and the Crypto Sniper. I do a lot of YouTube on all of these and the Reset Sniper. Uh, oil is going to be, uh, the peak demand has passed and that actually is going to be falling off in a way. That's why, wait for it, the Saudis are doing the biggest single listing. When you need a patsy in the room, what, what better than your citizens to unload at the top of the market? I think some of that's going to, is the reason. But anyway, why is, why is this slide up here? The IMF, the IMF have decided quantitative easing is an act of policy for financing and funding all the requirements for the green, uh, the fact that our planet's going to end in 10 years' time, apparently, according to Greta, a 14-year-old girl. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about that because you're going to get to pay for that one. Um, and they talk about quantitative easing. I'll try to highlight it. There's a bit of overexposure on the screen net, um, but I'll put it up on slide net, and if you drop an email, you can get all the slides. But that's what they say. So here's... A, a, Trans-global organization of dubious um, assessment, the original United Nations building, by the way, donated by the Rockefeller, as was 9-11. They were the New York Ports and Harbor. They gave that land, very kind of them, actually, uh, and everything else that went with it. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so what, what, do you, what you have here is the IMF that's been set up by them and is now telling you that we're going to have perpetual QE on account of a green agenda. How's that going to turn out for your currency? You know, I, I left 20 years ago, I can tell you in the RAND, I never used to get a leopard. You know what a leopard is? That 200 RAND note, that was like big top, 200. Now I have to draw like three grand and it's gone in no time. And I'm just fistfuls of leopards and what can I buy with this? Next to nothing in RAND. It's when you travel around and you see other fiat currencies that you realize these guys are proliferating like no tomorrow. Um, anyway, so the IMF is going to play a role uh, and it's going to come dressed in green. Your communists, your Bolsheviks, your global Bolsheviks that want to control you are going to come dressed in green. Uh, and how can you say no? Because it's for the children. You're destroying their planet. Okay, back to the yield inversion narrative. Back to the yield inversion narrative. Here you have it. Um, some of you might remember 87. I started my investing career in 87. Um, I decided it was a great idea to get into the stock market. I was about to go in the army for two years. That's, they still did that, um, and uh, of course failed at university. Someone said I had a BSc. I had a shot at it with that material science. I hated it. Uh, I threw in the towel, uh, and then I went straight into the army. Uh, and, I, and I went in August '87, and I just had a dead aunt uh, who left me some money in the UK. I put the whole job lot in the stock market, and then I got a wake-up call, and I'd lost about 45% of my money, my entire net worth. So that was my beginning in investment, and it was love at first bite, I can say. Anyway, so 87, um, we had a yield curve inversion. Some of you will, most of you will definitely remember the dot-com uh, 2000 and the aftermath uh, of that. It was rather chilling. Um, I actually think we went technically into our first global depression then. They never say a depression. How many, everyone knows the, the statistical, or the, the, what the phrase is for a recession, what you need to be in a recession. How many here actually know the, the definition of a depression. Anyone, put up your hand. Negative growth for two quarters is a recession. What's a depression? Two successive quarters. A depression is for an entire year with systemic bank failure. I think we started that process actually in dot-com, but we definitely hit it in 2007-08. The biggest monetarist criminal, Alan Greenspan, performed his liquidity experiment we dropped rates so, so low and then reinflated uh, after 2000 and gave us the property boom that led to so many people being sold the dream by George Bush, that ninja loans being put in homes then on reset rates of two years and then being thrown out. Um, so it was, it was really a big mess around. Anyway, that was the second yield convert, uh, inversion. And what is the yield inversion? So I said I'd explain it. Let's do it really simple. The government likes to borrow from you. Apart from taxing you, they also want to borrow from you. So what do they do? They have long-term borrowing, where you can say, give it back to me in 30 years' time. 
or that short-term borrowing, give it back to me in five or ten years or even two or three months' time. And technically, the yield curve should go up. The longer you're giving them your money, you should be paid a higher interest rate. The shorter you're giving them your money, you should be paid a lower interest rate. What happens when people, uh, when too much demand starts pushing on one side of the curve is it inverts. In other words, they have to try to attract short-term money and their rate ends up going up and everyone is absolutely bricking it and scared and tying up their money long-term for very low rates. It's called inversion. That's usually a fear signal. It's a very strong fear signal. It's a 100% signal. We dipped again, as you can see, 0708. You'll all remember that. And we've just done it now. We've just done it now. And note, it doesn't happen when you dip in the red. It's in the recovery back up that it all starts. So this is a leading indicator. Most indicators lag. In technical analysis, you hear me damn most technical indicators for lagging. I'm only interested in leading indicators. This, for economics, is a leading and almost 100% shoeing. So I'm afraid to say I'm the bearer of bad news. I'm delivering some doomsday porn for you all here. Um, it's going to get rough. Uh, and this is at a global level. Um, so let's talk about uh, precious metals. Precious metals. Okay, so we had a blow-off boom. That all started the quantitative easing. When they first broke cover with quantitative easing for the first time after 2008, we absolutely mooned it. This is against the dollar, by the way. And we went right up to 1,927. We predicted new highs for gold. We even gave targets and it overshot our targets, which left us a bit bewildered. Because we like to be right, but we like to take all the money the market wants to give us, not only a third of it. So we're a bit, uh, a bit upset. Uh, and we changed our theory and it won't happen again. And then it had, like anything, overperformance begets future underperformance. This is the same in sport. Any English rugby fans out there? <laughs> Semi final to final? Yeah. And so it is in the fight game, so it is in business, so it is in life, so it is as a trader. We actively talk each other down after a big win because you're going to be too arrogant, you're going to be too sloppy, and you're going to give it all back. It's the natural psychology of things. Anyway, in the same way markets, too many people became buy at any price, I can't bear to hear about my mate making all the money and I'm not, just get me in, we've had the same in Bitcoin, we have the same in .com, what do you do, you have a massive bear, as it takes a while or years of narrative to unwind and people to just give up and lose interest, so we had a proper bear, then we got that squeeze, so what did I say during the squeeze, well you've got a rounded bottom there, oh, who doesn't like a rounded bottom, um, anyway, the rounded bottom, and on top of that, you've got yourself what we call an HVF method, um, hunt volatility, cover method, a squeezing of volatility. Squeezing of volatility occurs when there's a lot of compression. Price is reaching a point of agreement. It's getting really tight. In other words, the buyers are coming up, but they're not ready to charge. And the sellers are saying, yeah, it's coming up a bit, I'll let go of a little bit, there's a little, let go of a little bit. And the volume is drifting off and it's tightening, it's tightening. Later, you get, it's a continuation pattern, by the way, not a reversal. Uh, later, you get a subsequent major uh, impulsive move. And we're interested as traders in very tight risk. So we want to set a nice little tripwire for the bear to step through at the high probability place where we know that you can see the deer and he's still in the tree line and the water's right there. And we like to keep the stop really tight. So we're not risking too much and we can trade bigger. And we like the impulsiveness, the volatility returning gives us because it gives you a massive reward. So everything we do is high reward to tight risk. It means you might lose a few more, your losses are taken quickly, our losses are, our winners are held for a long time. Every successful trader holds these trades for a long time, um, longer than his losses. Losses quick, trades uh, winners long. Uh, beginners, they hold on to their losers, they really want them to come back, they hate to be wrong, um, and they snatch a profit the first time they've offered it. Yeah? So you've got to watch that. If you, any of you are trading and active, or even investors in the market, watch that tendency, please. So anyway, it's gold versus the dollar. Um, this is gold versus the euro. So you might think, um, wow, gold's going up against the dollar. It's going up against everything fiat currency. In other words, gold and Bitcoin, I'm, this is a crypto crowd, uh, I'm totally with you, we're going to bring the crypto into it, but gold is the original crypto in, in that sense. It's just non-electronic. In fact, there was a guy who started e-gold in America, and he was rounded up, arrested, and put away, and he had the solid ounce for everybody that gave him money of gold. There was nothing fraudulent about him. He's getting more life sentences than a serial killer. Um, that's how serious they are about not you, not undermining their money system. Um, anyway, so this is against the euro. This is another HVF as we call it. I won't get technical. The squeeze, the burst, the fast move, it's awesome. 
You sit tight and you let it run. And you stay in the trade. The money's made actually in the sitting, guys. Not the order entry, not jumping in and out. The money's made in the sitting, and that's uh, the value of method. That's against the pound. Can you see a similar structure each time? It doesn't matter what each central bank is saying. They're all cheats. They're all proliferating it. They might be doing it at different times to different levels. But if you're playing an anti-fiat, you get the same DNA with marginal differences dependent on each of the currencies. By the way, we called a big property crash in Australia. They kind of skipped through the 208 because China was creating so much money and chucking it their way. They almost skipped right through uh, the last one. So they've had a double boom of property. We said, guys, short the Aussie. They're going to deflate their currency harder than any of the others. And make sure you've got your gold if you're in Australia. That's how it looks in Australia. That's already met first target, and we expect overperformance to that. So that's why you should have gold. I'm going to introduce you to a gold and silver ratio. So we compare things to each other. Now, silver is like a little sister to big brother gold. And when things get running, she runs even faster. She runs, she's higher beta. That's what's called a higher beta. But when it's bad, it's real bad, she wets the bed. Um, when it's good, she's off like a dirty sock on laundry day. And you have that ratio. One single uh, gold uh, ounce at the current moment went as high as 90. At the top of those two red lines, you, only, you could get 90 silver ounces. Now this is an inverse relationship. What does it mean? It means opposite is good. That means when this gets very high, the metals are at all time under valuation. So when you have a very high gold to silver ratio, one gold ounce gets you how many ounces of silver? This is historic, by the way. The 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the ratio was 15. We're at 90 now. The modern history post, uh, modern economic theory, whatever we want to call it, the voodoo and magic they pull, um, it's been about 25, 30, uh, and at the moment we're at, uh, we were hit as high as 90 and we're in the mid 80s. By the way, that subprime collapse, that was when gold went to 19.27 and silver went to $50. You could have bought it at two or three. Not quite crypto returns, but not too shoddy, if you don't mind me saying. Um, that's at 30. It collapsed from 90 to 30. So the silver was running three times faster than an already fast running gold. So you get a multiplier on a multiplier there. Okay? We're at, we, this technical analysis is a rising wedge. And the, any, of, any of you know a bit of charting? Any hands here? Some charters? Rising wedge? What typically happens on a rising wedge? Break down to the downside. Both correct. Yes, indeed. So rising wedge, especially how do you feel about a rising wedge that's taken since 2011 till today, and, and what I'd call an eight-year, nine-year mega rising wedge? Should it be a small move or should it be proportionate in scale? Likely proportionate scale. You can't say for sure, but proportionate scale. So we have a downside break, we have a retest in. So we touched the highest side, which is an all time high, and we started to get jittery up there. It's looking down and saying, Buy me, that's a big fall. Um, and it breaks, and then it gets a little bit nervous and it scurries back in. It's the beginning of an unraveling. Um, so I also hope for some of you that you consider for yourselves. I have no uh, dog in this fight. I make no money if you do it. You'll only push the prices higher for me, uh, but that you have some silver and gold in your possession. Do not give it to a vault or a bank. That's kind of like giving your babies to the Epstein cartel. Um, don't do it. Um, so a couple of equity shares for you. Um, Majestic, I really, really like it. Similar structure. Major, major squeeze uh, coming on. And Hyper potential risk reward again. We've got a target on that well over 36. It's trading in and around um, tens at the moment. So there will be equities that are exposed to precious metals that you can also explore. I know you're crypto guys, you're not all equity traders. That's fine. We'll get to the crypto, but consider a broad strategy. If things get really ugly, so I've looked at a lot of countries where they've had a system of a down. I was traveling to Ukraine prior to the, the May Dunn events. Um, I suddenly noticed that the airports, they stopped giving me greed now for my uh, British pounds because I was traveling from London. And this was a year and a half before all the stuff went down. And then afterwards I thought about it and I thought, how come they aren't stocking this stuff anymore? Did they know something? Anyway, they didn't give me greed now anymore. And then eventually when everything went down, guys that had Porsche Cayernes there, they shut the banks down. You couldn't draw more than $50. It's also the Cyprus situation. What happens? You get constrained by how much money you can draw. Everybody gets pinched. There's no liquidity for you. Uh, people are selling their brand new cars for 20% of the value for hard cash, and you have that crisis. We could have, I'm not being alarmist, but there could be an element of that at a global scale. 
So you've seen microcosms of this, Cyprus, Ukraine, Zimbabwe. Anybody remember that bit, what Bitcoin hit on Zimbabwe? Uh, I think with a year or two ago, it was three or four times uh, the height. So watch out uh, for um, grid down, because what use is Bitcoin if we don't have electricity, mobile network, or internet network? Uh, there can be circumstances where electronic money can be limiting. Okay, there's a couple of equities, another falling wedge in another round at the bottom. All of those things I'm deeply in love with. Um, and I'd suggest that's worth taking a look at. That's an, um, uh, an, F, that's an ETF, sorry, of gold and silver miners. So this is what happens. The, the ETFs and the equities lag because they so bared out. They so dispassionate, they so, so many cries of wolf, they don't believe it anymore. So gold and silver starts moving, and what ends up happening is they don't respond. It's like, yeah, no, I've seen this one before, and you're about to dump again, and we're about to go crashing back down. No, we're not fine, thank you. You cried wolf 413 times, it's not, gonna, it's not ever happening. And then what happens is the metal keeps moving, and it keeps moving, and then it keeps building and base building, and suddenly the, the, the news for the, the fundamentals for the metal start improving, and then stocks suddenly think, Jesus, we better get our running shoes on. And they jump up and they try to play catch up. So you can get a bit of that, uh, it's still early doors. That's a falling wedge on equities, gold miners ETF. Uh, that's that falling wedge I was showing you on a smaller time frame. So I've gone from a big chart just into that little red circle that I was showing you. Again, that's a continuation pattern for upside. We like a falling wedge because there's a pinch. Who doesn't like to have a pinch in the right places? Over there, you've got it, and you'll trade beautifully off that. Okay, a little bit about the money and proliferation of M2. So China, you can't see the numbers. Luckily, I, uh, I remember them, um, but China's got 450 tons of gold. Um, I'll bring this back to RSA and mining. South Africa's fallen way down there. That's the top 10. We're in eighth position for gold. By the way, in our peak in the 70s, when the rand was uh, parity to the pound or close to parity and, and better than the dollar, we had a thousand tons. So China at 450, it's, it's really not a lot, but that's if we believe their stats as well. Um, then you go down Australia, Russia, United States, etc. So we no longer a gold producer, but I'm going to show you something that's interesting. If gold goes up, ah, it's such a pity, you know, you, there's two lines on there. The gold price is the upper one. And I've highlighted when the gold price goes down, the RAND goes down. So there's a bit of a correlation with the RAND, even though it's not a big part of our economy. It's relatively quite high. But it's also an anti-dollar. It means the dollar's getting weak, and then the RAND obviously does better against the dollar. So you're getting an anti-dollar effect with the gold. Now recently, gold's gone up, but unfortunately, the RAND in that last piece that I'm showing you with a question mark, with gold having gone up, has not responded. Um, so the FX emergings, are battling and I've dived in a little bit tighter time frame. I'm sorry for this that the charts are a little bit overexposed there um, but again you can see the divergence. So the blue line is the aggregate gold up and actually we've gone down on the RAND despite normally getting a little bit of support when gold's going up and then when gold's going down really falling through the floor. So it was RAND, uh, USD Reserve versus gold that you've been looking at and there's a bit of an uncoupling. So I'm a bit concerned about FX emerging. Guess what? Most of you live here, I'm assuming. Um, you should have a plan. Have a plan, Bitcoin, gold, silver, talk to your Luno guys, start getting some other assets in. Um, then, the, yeah, so that's the divergence. I've also done it for Mexican peso, so I don't think it's only RAND. Some of you will think, yeah, the state-owned enterprises, all the Zuma stuff's coming out, it's all bad about us. I think generally it's going to be, so that's the tequila crisis as well that I'm rolling in here. I think emergings are all going to have a problem. Um, so it's not specific only to the RAND. So, my biggest trade, actually I'm not put on here, because I wasn't sure how much time to get, uh, I'd have and how to involve you. So before I get into the crypto side, I want to talk about the Korean one and Southeast Asia. Um, so, China trade war, this Trump trade war punch and Judy show that they're putting on for you here, um, and managing, there's a reason for that. It's kind of like subprime. It started out, hmm, certain banks are having concerned about the state of the housing market. This is all pre the Lehman first starts getting soft and then really accelerates down. There's always a couple of stages or amplification in the crisis. I think this China trade war is the beginning of something. So the Chinese yuan has been proliferated to the tune of 28 trillion in money M2. So that's money supply, that's notes, digits in the computer. Um, 14 trillion in the state. So everyone wants the dollar to die. But let's just talk about how much these guys have put out there. They've got a kind of peg. The Hong Kong dollar has a kind of peg. Um, what you've got is way too much fiat that was created, largely during the 2008 and 9. China became the main driver globally during that period. We were all on the boat of ours and uh, during the West 
during that ten-year period, and they got heavily, heavily leveraged, and they've overshot. Some people were saying that the cities they built, the roads, etc., well into the future, they brought a whole bunch of growth that should be happening at a more normal rollout pace forward into the here and now, and then not much construction work left because you future-proof yourself to 2,300. Uh, and the, what, the five million future citizens will have. So they've got into uh, a little bit of a problem. So my suspicion is this trade wars is going to turn out to be the narrative for a major reset in the yuan relative to the dollar. You're saying, hey, you're saying the dollar's going to go up. Actually, the, the global currency failure is not going to see the dollar just fall. There's lots of people who want the dollar just to fall. Here's the thing, and I Graham very aptly touched on it earlier in his talk. He said, you, you borrow into existence the first dollar. But where's the interest payments that's due by contract on that dollar? So what actually happens is you need to borrow more dollars. Who can create dollars? Only America. So if you're South Africa with dollar-based debt, how do you get more dollars to pay those extra interest payments as well as the capital back? Well, we're never paying the capital back, but just to serve the interest. You have to sell an absolute load of goods to America. Are we running a massive trade surplus with America? Or are many of the other third world nations running massive trade? No, they're not. So what actually ends up happening is all emerging nations are always on a losing wicket against the dollar because they are desperately in need of dollar. This is known as the dollar milkshake theory. Um, it's kind of like everyone puts a straw and everyone's trying to get some of the milkshake. You end up not getting a full milkshake because there's five other blokes with the same straw in the same bottle. Um, so you'll, you'll quickly get an idea about that. Google it, YouTube it, it's hysterical and it's true. Um, so actually we're going to have, in the bizarre sense, a shortage of dollars. Yes, they've just printed a whole bunch, but how does China, that's not even 1% of the SWIFT system, with twice the amount of M2 as America, get away with that without re-rating downwards something awful? And what does that do for any debt that they have? Well, they have one trillion in bonds that are positive, but it's a very difficult system. So the global fiat system is like the circle of dominoes. And you have lots of small ones, like the emerging nations, on the periphery. They get to die first when the barbarian horde comes. And the dollars, the dominoes get bigger as you head to the middle, and in the real middle, the middle is the queen domino, the tallest of them all, the dollar. Um, you have the euro, the pound, the yen, and all of these others, sort of semi-core, um, and then you have the peripheral. So we fall inwards from the periphery inwards. And actually, when they fall, where does that demand no longer wanting to hold Turkish lira, Mexican peso go? A large part of it actually will go into the dollar. So in the weird sense, part of the failure will actually be dollar appreciation. But of course, we're hoping there's going to be a big enough gain also into Bitcoin and into gold and into silver, into non-fiat options as well. So it's not going to 100% go. But don't think the dollar collapses. The dollar's measured is a crap currency being measured against other crap currencies. So it's a relative degree of crap. It's a fertilized bomb. Which one stinks more? Well, it's all pretty stinky. Um, so, here's crypto. So, I want to get over this concept of you have to be at your desk, putting in orders, reacting to the market, knowing the new stream and hyper. We don't do that kind of trading. We call it lifestyle trading. We're trying to sell a bit of sizzle, I suppose, guilty, because we don't do Lambos and girls in bikinis. I think that's uh, for the scam artists. But we do say you don't have to be permanently at your screen. You decide a trade. You have a trigger level, you have your stop, and you have your take profit, and you walk. You write the check for that trade. You've got to justify it for yourself. Each trade is like a business plan. We do all our work before. We do 360 degree view. We look at it across everything. Is the dollar week? Is the oil week? What's gold doing? And what the cryptos are doing? What are the alts doing relative to Bitcoin? You full on analysis, and then you decide what you're going to do. And we have a method for that, and it's called the HDF method. And we made a number of key decisions. I put up S first because most of you know it. I'll finish on Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum. And I've done this in a log chart, so it's a bit distorting. Does everyone understand the log scale? It's in percentage, because otherwise you get very big hockey sticks and very flat charts. So it's a log scale. Um, so actually that Ethereum was in and around the $340, but that green line up to the top was $2,400. Looks a bit disproportionate, but it was a mega spike. That was a beautiful ATF. We went long Ethereum, and we worked in Bitcoin. So I'm not a hater, just because I'm going to tell you about some shorts. I'm not a hater of crypto. I'm ambivalent. I want to buy something that's going up, and I also want to hold certain things that will see me through recent. So we have an investment strategy. We have a number of dials, an investment strategy for crypto, then we have a trading account, and then I have the Super Ligera Lamborghini account, which is your BitMEX account. We'll have 10x, 20x, 30x leverage, and that's a shoot for the moon. You all have a demon, 
that wants it. So what you do is you control how much money and you put your demon and you control where he plays. Then you do your three to five leverage on your Kraken, your Bitstamp and your Lunos. And then you have your one is to one, your coin base, your Lunos, and you just buy it. And that is either you in fiat or you in the coin. That will never be lost generally, and it's typically quite a long term. So we make three or four decisions a year. So you would have got long hair and you could have held for quite a while. We had signals to sell out. I'm showing you other points at 440. We said it was going to run that previous low and it was going to go in a bear. So we've actually been very negative Ethereum and the alts for a long time now. People hate, hate me a little bit because everyone's like, when's the alts going to run? You're always so bare on it. And the Bitcoin dominance keeps reasserting and the others just keep being very looky-likey. I know there's different tech with a lot of them, but there's also an awful amount of looky-likeys and I think we need a clean out of all the small shit points, if you can excuse the phrase, uh, that are out there. And that will be the beginning of the end. You need the death for the renewal. After the fire, the grass grows green. Without the fire, you still have a lot of scrub underneath it. So we, we went short at 440. We, we went short again at 200. That was the bear market of 6,000 Bitcoin as well, where we got nasty YouTube comments and we really hated there because we said it was going to go lower. There was a long in this mini recover, but generally, guys, the alts, if you throw a Fibonacci, anyone know Fibonacci? Great, there's a few of you technically right from the top to the beginning of uh, the, the, the bottom of the bear market. So from the top to the beginning of the bear, all the alts are sub 23.6, with a possible exception of Binance uh, and one or two others. That means they've not gone further than 23%. Most of them are well below, I'm talking about five or 10. Ethereum's about 4.5% away from that all time low compared to the 2,400 up there. Why are you buying those damn things? For your investment. They're giving you the deadest cat bounce. The cat is properly dead. It's three weeks old dead and ridden over by a steamroller. And you're looking it in the eyes and saying, you still love me. <laughs> Come on. There's one guy there that's ridden that rally. And he went well past the 61.8. And I sit there pissing on people's parade that want to buy alts until the market shows me. The truth is the chart. It's not what they say, it's what they do. Oh, but we've got new devs and new dats and new everything. And I'm like, why is no one investing in your coin? Simple as that. People, more people are investing in your coin, the coin goes up. It's simple as that. God's handwriting on the wall is the chart. So I always refer to the chart. The more amazing the story, the more likely there's a ramp. The same with Ripple. Ripple is flat as a pancake, and everyone is IMF's new coin, and, and we've done this, and they're announcing corporate major announcements every different day to get a, a spike and a complete flip. Those are short as paradise. Oh, there's still some optimists out there. Let's load up. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Short them back down. Um, let them give you your free money. Okay, so don't, don't, buy, don't buy the news. Look at the chart, analyze the chart, have method, be trained on that, and understand what you get. Be part of a community, I will say. Why? Because I'm selling a community. I'm part of it. My community helped me, so I'm talking my book. But it makes sense to me, and it could make sense to you. So we've been buy a short on Ethereum. I've done a little bit of cross crypto because I think there's a hard chance that Bitcoin might start getting a little bit of a bid under it now. There's a key level at the 6,000 to 6.5. I'll show you Bitcoin. So that's where we were really hated. I'm going to have to point it. Does this one have the laser? No. Over here, 6,000 to 6,800. I did little yellow highlights, but you won't see it. Um, that was a critical, critical level where we spent a lot of time. So I do analysis that's called volume by price. So what that does is I take all the data of volume that traded across many, many exchanges. But instead of having histograms that are vertically under the candles, that just tell you on that day how much trade it went by or on that week, I throw it across the price. Where did the bulk of the volume occur at a price level? And the price level is right through that 6,200 to 6,500 range on Bitcoin. So the volume by price chart, you won't see it, but it's a horizontal histogram. That is a huge histogram. The market really wanted to hold that level. We said, no, it's going to go, it's going to go. But it, they made a good fist of trying to defend it for a long, long time. And also, you spent a lot of time there, you can see it. So each day is being accumulated at that 6,000 level. So what happened or where are we now? Well, we're coming back down. Imagine that yellow area that I tried to highlight there that you probably can't see running all the way through. We're coming back down from the top side again. Could we support this time? Maybe. I think there's a slightly better chance than this time. I'll watch the price behavior. If it gives me a continuation pattern, it's going lower. If it gives me a reversal pattern, it could be basing out. So there's some optimism for the Bitcoin guys that are a bit upset. We did say at 10,000, get out of all your investments. All our community sold at 10K. They've now got 30 or 40% more Bitcoin. It's worth, it's worth the sub fees on that one trade alone. I, I talk about three or four key decisions on the major time frame charts, guys. 
Not sitting on five minutes, twiddling, jumping in and out of traffic. You're going to get run over. It's not a game of frogger. There's steamrollers out there. They're going to crush you. Um, do this. Don't make the exchanges rich. Build your own wealth. Short, small, key moment decision. Three or four years. And that's it. So I'm showing you basically most of what we did. We traded long from 5,000. We weren't the first. We didn't wait for it. We thought it would continue downstairs at the 3-2. We waited for it. It showed us. It's going up. Okay. You've shown that you're done. We're going long. And we ran the last part of that. You don't need the whole move. Forget the fantasy. Buying the low selling high. Get that little chunk. That's the game. And we have method to do that. By the way, we put these on YouTube. So if you're not following me, you're missing the free. That's the 6,004. BT to trade 3595 target, possible overperformance, September the 17th. All dated. I don't change any of my YouTube or my tweets. I don't delete them. The wrong ones out there as well. Go find them. Go, you, you lied or you were wrong. Doesn't matter. It's okay. It's not about wrong. It's about making money. We will be wrong. It's a probability based uh, situation. So we're going to be wrong. But we, we get the probabilities in our favor. So that's down there. You can see it. And also, we were warning that it's going to go down. Look at that Georgian hat and sunglasses. How can you not trust a man's opinion with that? <laughs> Um, and that was calling it, we're going to go to 6.8, and at the time we were $10,000. We're going to trade. That was a geometric generated target from what we analyzed. And it was saying on the long term charts, we overcooked. We're going to come in. Guess what? It's a valuable decision to get out at 10K. We are not. We finished um, all the slides. What do I think? I've got two more for you. So that was the first one, just saying, guys, shooting star. These were monthly charts. We look at big time trades. Everyone says technical analysis just for time fundamentals for the decision. No, we're just looking at two smaller time frame charts. We're going to big chart. Then you'll get the decision of what it's going to do. There you go. Two shooting stars, and that's how it is today. Uh, so that's the recent move. You could have avoided that pain, you hodlers, without being a day trader. You could have 30% more Bitcoin. You make that decision four times in a year. You won't get every single one right. You could have doubled the Bitcoin in a single year of four decisions. Possibly two and a half. So here's the bit that you want to hear. What do I think will next? This is my probability-based scenario of what I think comes next for Bitcoin. It's my final slide. I've overstood my time. Um, I'm going to be dragged off the stage here. Uh, 20K, 3K, 14K, I think we are at the bottom or we might probe a little bit lower. I'm kind of 55 that we're close to bo uh, bottoming out here. Um, but because of the 6K that I described as a very, very significant, I think this time we might support or we just run it a little bit. But I don't think we're running that 3K low. I think we're going to hold. I think buyers are coming up under because the great reset is coming. They're bailing out banks overnight on the repo rate, by the way. It's coming. Um, and we're selling across the top. There's still too many wounded people from the 2017. They say there's a mourning period. They actually have a month's name in technical analysis for dead. How long you mourn? It's the same for trade when you get your pass properly handed in a major pump move and then a dump. And that's kind of what happened. So those people are hurting. Um, so we have a secondary bull and we have a secondary bear. This is constriction. I think you're about to have the super macro continuation pattern of Bitcoin's entire existence. How's that for drama? In other words, I think a substantial move out of this will overperform and is of a scale not to be seen. And I expect it to coincide with a great financial reset. So those hodlers that have taken the pain, you may still end up right. I'm just going to suggest to you, wouldn't you like to be right with four or five times more Bitcoin than you've got now? Um, so that's the difference. By the way, I think timing might coincide with the US election as well. So I think Trump will get in again. This is speculation on my behalf. So he's, he's a natural antagonist. That's what he's supposed to be doing. He's antagonizing everybody. They'll put him in again, and they'll crash the thing on him. That's what they did with Bush. They crashed the whole thing. So they want a Republican. They want a conservative white male, and they want to crash it on him. And say, so you see, you can't let these guys drive anymore. They're useless. And they're going to do the same again uh, with Trump, I suspect. I suspect. That's a bit of political nuance. That's me just, what, what the hell? What can happen? So we focus on forward looking. We look back, what can we learn? And we apply it forward. And then we look at narrative and we see what's happening. And he's creating this China bargy bargy and everyone's going to blame him when it all goes off. It's perfect. It's all queued up. And all the gunslingers are there. They like this. There's pitchy hands all over the place. The shootout's about to happen. Um, and that's it. Okay, I'm Francis. I'm the crypto sniper, the market sniper, the reset sniper. Thank you for indulging me. Thank you very much. Francis, thank you so much. Okay, ladies and gents, I'm going to wrap up. It's getting a little bit late. Um, I think that if anyone does have questions for tonight, our speakers will be hanging out for a couple of minutes afterwards if you want to ask them directly. 
A huge, huge, huge thank you to SA Crypto and Luno for putting this event on the evening and to the set for having us. To Marius and Ramiz from Luno, it's been an absolute honour working with you guys to put this event on. People up and give do a bit of a shit for no one to take it, but we had such great time this evening. So I'm so, so glad that it happened. I'm sure it will be one of many, many events um, to come in the near future. So thank you, thank you all so, so much for being here. Please follow SA Crypto on all the social media platforms um, for all the information you need on the blockchain and, and crypto news, all the latest news. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks.